let me introduce you. Um, it's the Frankism Talmudism debate. Um, I think I'm going to moderate only in case the uh, it gets to disrespectful uh, tones, but. Um, generally, I, I'm not a debate bro, so I don't know how this usually goes, but I think one of you should lay down an argument and then the other one will respond, if that's okay, by then. Okay, I'll just ask, I'll ask Avi some questions for what he believes. Avi, do you believe that the Messiah can abrogate parts of the Torah uh, in order to commit sins? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so... Yes, I do. So that so that position is very well laid out in um, a lot of Kabbalistic books, right? So um, essentially, what we have is if you read if you read the Zohar, okay, uh, the Zohar says that you know eight had the Ath, the the tree of life, that it is what's responsible. It's the tree that rules over this construct that's responsible for you know having. Um, you know, what's permitted and, you know, what's forbidden, so to speak, right? Which is a duality of the construct, right? But then it says the tree of life is different in, whereas in the, with respect to the tree of life, the whole construct of you have what's permitted and you have what's forbidden doesn't apply when it comes to the tree of life. And if you read a lot of Kabbalistic texts, even within the Hasidic circles, right? Like, for example, if you read Tanya, there's an epistle in the Tanya where, um, where, you know, how Rab is discussing this, right? He's just discussing what basic theology from the Zohar, where the Zohar is saying, listen, we have two trees. We have Eitzhat Da'at, which is what's responsible for the Torah, that our Torah is from Eitzhat Da'at, which is why we have what's forbidden and what's and what's permitted. But, you know, Eitzchaim is a whole different story where, where, where that doesn't apply. And the Mashiach, the, the Mashiach bin David's root is from that tree, where he supersedes this whole construct of what's permitted you know, and what's forbidden. You also have the ancient sages in our ancient Mirashim and in our Talmudim also state that when the Mashiach comes, he's going to change the Torah and even abrogate parts of the Torah. And they bring in a lot of arguments and proofs, you know, for that, that when the Mashiach comes, you know, the, the, he's going to supersede the Torah, so to speak, because he's coming from Eitz Chaim. He's, he's come to okay. demolish his entire construct of Eitz Hadda'at, where we have what's permitted and forbidden. In fact, the Zohar also talks about two Torahs. It talks about the Torah of Atziluth and the Torah of Bria. There's two Torahs, right? The Torah that we have is the inferior Torah, which has the for, what's forbidden and what's permitted. But the superior Torah, the Torah of Atziluth, right, is the Torah where you transcend, you know, these these con this construct of you know this du dualistic construct of you have what's forbidden and what and you have what's permitted, right? So the Mashiach, okay. what, make, what makes the Mashiach, the, Mashiach the, the the powerful essence of the Mashiach is that he he transcends the Torah. Okay, the, the whole point of the Mashiach well, is he he transcends that? the Torah. Well, I'll address what you said now, and then you can respond to what I say, okay? Sure. Okay. First of all, the Zayat HaKadosh does not say that the Mashiach, for example, can violate the laws of the Torah or introduce new laws in the Torah ad oilam, meaning eternally, right, as Mashiach Rabbani did at Har Sinai, and that he will essentially combine Yitzchayim, or he will dissolve the two, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the two trees and so on and so forth in order to make it permissible to, uh, you know, sin or to commit things which are forbidden in this, in this Torah now. The Zayat Kaddish, both the Tanya and the Zayat Kaddish say that the what is the inherent essence of Sitra Akhra, meaning the inherent essence of what is called the other side, the concealment of Ara and Saif and so on and so forth, is Avedis, is sinning and so on and so forth, and that these things are completely Tameh. You can see what the Zayat Kaddish says on, you know, Sefer Tehilim 119, the Liquid Desire takes a different Sukkim and so on and so forth, and establishes that that the essence of the world is the Torah, not only the Torah that is in the different worlds, but the Torah that we have now, and that this is in reality. One, the Zayda Kaddish also says that the two Torahs in Atzlis and Bria doesn't say that one is uh, superior, one inferior, and one has things that you can practice, and one thing, well, one thing has uh, which things you can, which you can't practice, and so on and so forth. But rather, the Torah of Atzlis and Torah of Bria, one are is is talking the idea of, the, of there being a law in Atzlis and a law in Bria is talking about the structure of the two worlds or the order of the two worlds. How the laws of those worlds function, how the laws of this world function, not just in the idea of Hulkam Nishkatim, but also in like the very, you know, like how things, fuck, like how, um, you know, like how, how the, the, the nature of those worlds are, just like how we have uh, the laws of physics down here, they have the laws of, they have the you know, different, different laws of emanations, of Atzalus, etc. up there. Uh, the Zayat Kaddish, like I said, uh, uh, you know, establishes that the one, you know, one thing which, which must be completely nullified is the Klippa. 
and that Vyas Mashiach will only happen when, you know, it will only happen in two ways. When the world has the most, is the most like strongest klipa possible, right, on the earth, or when klipa has been completely nullified. The uh, latter, right, being when Mashiach comes in the clouds, and then the former being when Mashiach comes al Gaba Bahama. Tanya says the same thing. Uh, the uh, if, if anything, you can even look before the authorship of the Tanya. You can see that uh, even in um, uh, the Val Shemtov's book, Kesar Shemtov, for example, he establishes that the Sabbateans, okay, that what they would do with the Torah and how they interpret the Zayin Kaddish, that um, their interpretation of which you can bring down a new Torah from heaven. Not only that, but this new Torah will contain things with you know like the, the uh, permissibility of Vedas and so on and so forth come solely from their misinterpretations of Maishan Rakhav, of Kabbalah, and so on and so forth, where they would actually look at the uh, look at the text of the words that are, that are used in these different Sefer Kabbalah, such as, for example, mentioning things of kissing, mentioning things of, uh, you know, uh, union via intercourse, and so on and so forth, and they would hold them literally. This was the criticism of Baal Shem Tov and also of Tzadik Akayin, of the Sabbateans. Um, regarding bringing down a new Torah from heaven in general, this is expressively forbidden in every single Sefer that you'll find on the earth, okay? There's not a single statement in the Gemara that says that Mashiach will ever introduce new elements in the Torah and into the Torah at all, and that he will bring down a new Torah from heaven in which will cause abrogation to the, to, to the law now. The only thing which you could possibly reach to say is that the Torah on this earth, there can be temporary takonis, temporary, uh, you know, fixations, right, to the law which is current, which, you know, which is currently established now, but that in the future, these things may be abolished as they are not ad oilam, as they are not eternal. They are not, which, they are not that which was established belongs to the Torah. You have in the Gemara, in multiple different places in the Gemara, it repeats the same Baraisa. But the origin of the Baraisa is not only found at Sinai, it's also repeated by Shmuel and Avi. You can see the Sefer's Tamir 16a, it says, Ein muvi rasha l'chadish davar me'ata. It means that a prophet cannot addition a new thing from here uh, from from here on, uh, and it's talking about a certain pasuk in Vayikra that says Eilah mitzvahs. These are the mitzvahs, and so on and so forth. You also have uh, Sefer Devarim. You have Sefer in, in Sefer Devarim, uh, chapter twenty nine. It says that the hidden things are, are the hidden things are for Hashem Bashuwan. The hidden things are for God in heaven, but that which is revealed is upon us and our children forever. You also have in Bamidbar, you also have in Mesechus Bamidbar, I almost said Mesechus, Sefer Bamidbar, uh, in the book of Numbers 25-13, where it says that Tun Chasekoyen, his bris, his, uh, his covenant as a, as a, you know, in the Kahuna is also eternal. And then you also have in Tehilim, you have Tehilim 119, 160, where it says the Mishpatim, and this the Mishpatim referring to the Mishpat Taita, I mean, the judgments of the Taita, right, are eternal. It says that your righteous judgments are eternal. So no, you will not find Anything in the Gemara, the Midrashim, or Sifra Kabbalah, and so on and so forth, which says that Mashiach will abrogate the law, and that he will bring down a new covenant, or bring down a new law, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I've heard what you had to say, and, you know, that's incorrect, and I can go through, I can actually go through a number of sources, uh, you know, contradicting that. Um, just give me a second here, because uh, I just want to see if I, I, I wanted to um, bring down this screen and see if I could... Um, you know what? Give me, give me a second. Let me go to my computer because I wanted to bring some of these sources so I can bring them forth to you um, and show you, you know, that you know you're incorrect on many of your assertions. So the first point I want to bring up is that Rabbi Rabbi Akiba, um, in one of his books, I think it's in his uh, Sefer Otiot, um, he he explicitly states there that the Mashiach is going um, to bring a new Torah. In fact, we also have the oracle. Um, in your Miyahu, in chapter 31, where, 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 where Adonai says, you know, behold, I'm going to make, you know, a new covenant, um, you know, with the house of Israel, right? So it's talking about a new covenant, so to speak, a new Torah that's going to be made with the house of Israel. You know, he starts to, he starts to make some points about it, you know, like, hey, it's not going to okay. be, it's not going to be anything like the one that, that I gave at Mount Sinai. But you okay. didn't, hold on. Wait, can I, can I respond to this point really quickly? Sure. But you didn't read the rest of the parak. In 31, it says that this one will not be like the one that I made with your fathers. But if you read the rest of the parak, it doesn't say, for example, that this means that there's going to mean new laws, new mitzvahs, and so on and so forth. What it says is that, it, it, what it says specifically is that the dissimilarity between the two between the two covenants is that this covenant has been filled to be kept multiple times by multiple different people, whereas in the Inyame in Mashiach, everybody will be keeping this covenant and so on and so forth. How do we know? Because of the fact that Hashem says that just as he has established the sun and moon as eternal, he has also established this Torah which he has given to Am Yisrael as eternal. 
Secondly, in Oisius de Rabbi Akiva, it mentions the same thing, that the new Torah of the Mashiach will not be a Torah, will not, the newness of that Torah will not be that it'll have new laws, new chokim, new mishpatim, but rather that it will basically, that it will be this covenant better remembered. Okay, so that's fine. I heard what you had to say. So it's sort of, to me, it's sort of like common sense it's kind of implied, right? When he says a new covenant, a new Torah, this means that there's going to be, there's going to be modifications, right? That is to, your interpretation. That's fine. Okay, you, you, you can say that. That's fine. You, you can say that. But to me, it seems very apparent that when you're using the word, you know, you're going to say, you know, um, Bert Chadasha, new, new covenant, that that just implies on a very basic common sense level that there's going to be modifications here. And you have to read a little bit into the text to understand you, you can't just have the same Torah. If, if it's, everything is the same, if everything is the same, okay, it makes no sense for Adonai to say, I'm going to give you a new, I'm going to make a new covenant with Israel. If everything is the same as, as the status quo, it literally Aye. makes no sense to say, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a, a Shah with Israel. Mute this guy, whoever's talking. Yeah, I muted him. Mute him. You didn't mute him. I did. Um, no, you didn't. He is still talking. Um, really? I'm okay, you muted him for you. Okay, you muted him. Okay, no, I, I muted him. Uh, it shows me I he is literally him. Okay, I'm just. I just uh, anyways, uh, Abby, uh, you. You. Can somebody mute this guy? Bitch, you're too far. The, do you hear him, Abby? What's that? What's that background noise? I still hear him. You need to the guy server mute him. Joined and he's talking. You need to server mute him. I muted him. No, no, sir. You did not mute him. The guy who co is called Robux Daddy. Yes, you did not mute him. It shows me I muted him. Uh, let me. Do you yeah. have? Okay, are you? Do you know how to use? How long have you been? I, I just, just give me mod. Just give me mod. Just give me mod. I'll give you mod. Um. We know. Do. You. I'm trying to find where. Where do I give you mod? Just give you your role. <laughs> okay. God damn it! Can somebody? Can somebody? Can somebody mute this? Can somebody mute this podcast, Yeah, yes, yeah. I, I'm just uh, editing your roles to, to permit you to mute people. I don't. Yeah. Okay. So now you can mute members. Do okay. It. Well, let me see. It's the case. Okay. There we go. Finally, okay. I don't know why it's gone. So, okay, anyways, so, so. if we were just we just one more thing, if you look in your meal thirty one, okay, you go to verse thirty four. It says, let's see, hold on. It says, uh, sorry, verse verse thirty six, right? It says, if these laws should ever be annulled by me, and it actually says, you know, these chukim, meaning these statutes, like the chukim and the spots, and the two categories of mitzvahs in the Torah, should ever be annulled by me. It says Hashem. Only then would the, would, would the B'nai Yisrael, only when the sons of Israel, the Zerah Yisrael, the seeds so of Israel, what, would cease to be what, a nation before me. What what chapter, what, what book, chapter, and verse are you in? 31, Jeremiah 31, verse 36. Uh, sorry, hold on, let me go there. So, the newness, like I said, like you're saying, oh, if there's a, only, if it's complete similarity, then it can't be a new covenant. Well, the dissimilarity is specifically that this covenant, right, will be better kept by all the Imus and also by Am, by Am Yisrael perfectly. Whereas today it is not kept perfectly because of the oh, fact that's that a, that's so. So you're talking you're talking about you're you're talking about two different things because you're talking about cause and effect, right? The the the, the, the Torah is one thing, right? Whether whether Israel keeps it or not is a whole different is a whole different matter. In in the in the oracle here, he's not talking about you know necessarily whether Israel is going to keep it or not. He's talking about the covenant. He's not talking about Israel's commitment to the Torah, whether they're going to keep it or not. He's strictly talking on the covenant. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And it makes no sense to say, oh, it's everything's going to be the status quo in the future. Nothing's going to change. That makes no sense because he's saying a new covenant. New covenant, by definition, means there's going to be modifications. Okay? But now, I, want, I, I, I wanted to read to you um, what's stated in Tanya. So I'm going to just read you uh, a passage from Tanya because I think that... Show me the, 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 the book yeah, so and is, the book of Tanya. Is, yeah, this is uh, Tanya, this is Igaret Akodesh, Epistle 26. And I think that what he says here um, is is sort of what is understood by all of the great Kabbalists, whether whether you're a Shabbatian, a Hasidic, Orthodox, you know, Orthodox Kabbalists, all Kabbalists understand what he's saying here very well. And, and I'm going to read you here what he's saying. So he's saying, what, I'm just going to read the passage here, he says, um, you know, he's quoting a, a passage from Raya Mehemna in the Zohar, 
um, you know, where it's talking about the two trees, you know, um, and he says, however, when the tree of life will dominate, the tree of good and evil will be suppressed. And, and, and so, and he says, accordingly, the prescribed, the, um, the permitted, the impure and the pure will not be removed from the illiterate persons though. So if you read this passage here, what he's saying is what I was saying earlier, where he's saying the, the, the this passage in the Raya Mehemna is saying that there are two constructs, two trees and two Torahs. And the current Torah that we have is from Eitz Hadda'ath, where we have permitted and forbidden. And you can see here in the passage, he says, however, when the tree of life will dominate, the tree of good and evil will be suppressed. And what what did he say here in this epistle of the tree of good and evil? He says it's it's the whole, it centers around the essence of their being permitted and forbidden. Okay? And then if I go down, uh, let me see here where it goes down here. He says, uh, uh, he says here, but in truth, when you will examine closely the above quoted text of the Raya Mehemna, and the tree of good and evil, which is Esor and Hetur, you will note that he did not say the teaching of Esor and Hetur or the laws of Esor and Hetur. Rather, he meant to say that which is prescribed and that which is permitted is of the tree of good and evil or the Kripat Nogat as stated in Eitz Chaim. So he's setting here the precedent and letting you know, okay, this whole Torah that we have, which is from Sinai, okay, pertains to this inferior tree. And this is the whole, this is the whole understanding of what happened at Mount Sinai because there were two Torahs at play, right? The original Torah that, that Hashem wanted to give to Israel was broken and it was shattered. And, and they, they, were not, they were not worthy of receiving that Torah, which is a whole different Torah than the one that was given. And so what Musha did was he gave the inferior Torah, which is from the tree of, of, of Da'at, which is permitted and forbidden. Because Israel wasn't worthy of that higher Torah, right? And even even when you talk about all the universes that are spoken of, um, you know, in the Kabbalah, every universe has a different Torah. So we have all these different Torahs, and even they even come into play in this construct because the Torah that Hashem wanted to give, which is way more superior than the one that was given, was not given. And so what the Kabbalah teaches is that when the Mashiach comes, that's the whole point of the new covenant in Yirmiyahu is he saying when the Mashiach comes. He's going to give that new Torah. He's going to renew the Torah back to the original Torah that was originally meant to be given to Israel. And you have to understand that the Mashiach, by definition, he transcends um, the, tree, the, the tree of life because the, 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 the name Mashiach permutes to Shem Chai. Mashiach is Shem Chai, which is Eitz Chaim. Okay? And so he transcends uh, the whole construct of their being permitted and forbidden. He's beyond that. That's, he's, he's from the universe of Atzilut, which is beyond that. He's all beyond our understanding of, of this concept of permitted, forbidden, and the whole Torah that was given. So that, that's the whole point. And that's what Harab is laying out here in this epistle in Tanya. He's, 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 he's read the passage in Raya Mehemna. The Raya Mehemna is very clearly saying, hey, there's two, there's two Torahs. The Torah of, of Bria okay. and the Torah of Atzilut. The Torah of Bria is, is Eitz Ta'at. The Torah of Atzilut is Eitz Chaim. They're two separate Torahs. One is a subset of the other. It's not to say that they're completely different. But it's to say that one is a subset of the other. So the current one that we have is partially a subset of that higher Torah, but not, but not entirely equal to that Torah. So that's that's where you get this new covenant, this new renewal okay. of, of the Torah. Okay, let me let me address this now. All right. So you didn't read the rest of the Tanya. You did not read the rest of the Tanya. You didn't, you didn't even read the Tanya before that. Okay, as it says, literally in the in the exact same in the exact same epistle, and the and the. Uh, the tree, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, i.e., prohibition and, perm and permission, impurity and purity, will no longer dominate Israel. For their sustenance will derive only from the side of the tree of life, wherein there is no problematic, uh, pro problematic query which emanates from the side of evil, and no controversy which emanates from the side of impurity. As it is written, and the spirit of impurity I shall remove from the earth. When it says, thus the Talmud Chachomim, well, the Torah scholars will not be sustained by illiterate people, but from the side of good, uh, who eat that which is pure, kosher, and permitted. Nor will they be sustained by the mixed multitude who eat that which is impure, ritually unfit, and prohibited. And the Zayar says, while the tree of, of good and life dominates the world, these chachumim who are likened uh, who are likened to Shabbos and to the Yom Tevim, to uh, you know to uh, Yom Nirayim, Yom Tevim, Chagim, and so on and so forth, have nothing except what is given to them by those who are called unsanctified ones, just like Yom Shabbos, just like the day of Shabbos, uh, which uh, which only has that which has been prepared for it on a weekday. However, when the tree of life will dominate, the tree of good and evil will be suppressed, and the illiterate people will only have what the Talmud HaChomim give them. They will be subjugated to them as if they did not exist in the world. Hold on. 
I have no idea what it was, but I'm just going to continue. His last Accordingly, the, the prohibited and the permitted, speech. the impure and the pure will not be removed from the illiterate people. As, regard, uh, uh, as regards to them, there will be no difference between the era of exile and the days of Mashiach except for the Jewish people's release from servitude to the nations. For they will not have taste of the tree of life and will require Mishnayis uh, of prohibition and permission and purity and uh, impurity and purity. This is not talking about how the Talmud Chachomim, it's not even talking about all of Amishol, it's not even talking about all of the world. It's specifically talking about that Talmud Chachomim will, will transcend the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right, or transcend the tree of knowledge of good and evil into the tree of life. It is specifically talking, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's specifically talking about the fact that in Yemei HaMashiach, the Talmud HaChachomim, those who have, who have uh, Torah knowledge and so on and so forth, the Mekobalim, transcendent knowledge, due to their schus, will transcend all things, will transcend, you know, uh, will transcend all things, including the limit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and even see beyond that. Secondly, it is talking about how in this world, Talmud HaChachomim receive from the Ame HaArtsis, they receive from foolish people, they receive from people who partake in things which are, partake which they, uh, partake in things which are Tameh, and so on and so forth, and that they will no longer need to be around them, they will no longer need to receive from them in order to continue in their existence and into the Medatayra. So, it is not saying that Talmud HaChachomim, for example, or, or any, not let, let alone the rest of humanity, but specific Talmud HaChachomim can practice that which is permitted and that which is impermissible. It is simply saying that Talmud HaChachomim will have the spiritual level where they will no longer need, for example, to learn Tyra for the sake of keeping themselves from sinning, but rather they will learn Tyra because uh, as you know, a practice of Das Hashem, as a practice of doing Hashem, and so on and so forth. Whereas in this life, we learn Tyra in order to keep ourselves from sinning, due to the fact that we are in a state of impurity and so on and so forth, Tamim Dechachomim will transcend even above that and will continue to learn and practice Torah, not for the sake of keeping, uh, not for the sake of keeping themselves from falling into temptation. Whereas the people who are not learned, okay, will continue to do so, and like the Tanya says, they will require Mishnais. You're reinterpreting the Tanya. You are reinterpreting the Tanya to say things that it, that it doesn't actually say. Secondly, oh, uh, you keep saying, you keep interpreting Yom 31, you keep interpreting Jeremiah 31 as whatever you want it to be. But the thing is, is that you say, oh, I think it's implied, I think it's implied, I think it's implied. But there's no evidence for it being impl for that meaning that you're forcing onto it being implied. Rather, the chapter itself says that if the hukim, meaning if the statutes laid out in the Torah are ever abolished before our Kaddish Baruch if, they're ever, if they are ever changed and so on and so forth, that Am Yisrael will, will cease to be a people before him. And as you know, Am Yisrael are established as an eternal nation that will never die out, that will never be replaced by another, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, yeah. like I said... It doesn't say, for example, like the, the newness is not what you think it is. The, you, you can't, in, you know, force your own interpretation onto the noon, onto oh, the actual text of the tire okay, itself. So I, I, the newness I, 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 is merely that the tire in of itself will be better kept. Oh, hit that. So I, I, I've heard what you had to say, and the very first couple of sentences that you read from, from the Tanya exactly proved my point. So it's very clear to me that you're not fully understanding what the Tanya is saying. Um, and, and what the correct interpretation is. In fact, what I'm saying is what most Kabbalists, you know, agree on, you know? Um, so to me, it's just, it's, it's, it's very clear that you're, you're really not fully understanding, you know, what's being said in, in, in the Zohar. That's what it passage. says in Tanya. A little, do you want me to read it again? You can, why don't you read the first couple of statements that you said? Because the first couple of statements that you read, that you were beginning to read, exactly prove my point. Beautifully and brilliantly prove exactly yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, but you keep reading them, you keep reading those first statements, and then you don't read what's immediately after them. I do. I am reading. Listen, I'm not going to say that I fully agree with everything that the Tanya is saying, but the core principle. No, you're I'm ripping it out of context. You can't. No, this is not. This no, is not I'm permissible. Not, I, I don't. I don't. I don't fully. I don't fully agree with everything he's saying in that epistle. But what's important for me here is the core principle at hand. The core principle that he's laying down is a core principle that all Kabbalists are in agreement is, which is that there are two Torahs. One is an inferior. One is superior. That's the Torah of Atu, The Torah of Bria, no. the Torah they don't, the Zayda Kaddish does not say that these okay. things are two separate titles. The Zayda, for example, if you've read anything in the Gemara, if you've read anything in Midrash, if you've read any Sefer before have in your you, life, have you will see you, that, you, you, will see that it's established, you, you will see that it's established that the idea of something being called Tyrus Atzilus or Tyrus Bria is applied to everything. There is Tyrus Shaidim, there is Tyrus Abram, Tyrus Yitzchak, okay, Tyrus Yaptai, and so on and so, so forth. So, these are not so, referring to two different covenants. Okay, like I, 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 I understand. I've, I've I've heard, I've heard what you had to say. We're going to disagree on that. But here's my question to you. Oh, you no. Know, this, was, this was what Midrashim's forums say. This is not, this is literally what, like, it was well, what the actually, is, so, there's, 
so there is so so first of all there's contradictions because you have, you, have one, you have one rab in the talmud stating that the torah and its meets are each forever eternal okay and then you have another rab in the talmud in tractate nita in folio 61a saying that in the future, the mitzvot are going to be abrogated and annulled. But you didn't well, read that. I know, I know the Baraisa, but the Baraisa in 61a does not say mitzvahs. It doesn't say mitzvahs de Araisa. It does not say mitzvahs de Araisa. It doesn't say commandments that were from Harsina. It says mitzvahs de Rabbanan. If you read Taisvis, specific, if you read Taisvis on the Baraisa, you'll see that the context is that they're talking about a mitzvah de Rabbanan, which is to bury somebody, which is to bury somebody while embalmed. Okay? Yeah, I, because I, of the Yasamaisim, that mitzvah de, that mitzvah de Rabbanan will be abolished. That's not yeah, talking I, about mitzvahs de Araisa. Yeah, Meaning, and I, no. And, and, I understand, and, 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 and I would disagree with that, because there's other, other Midrashim as well that say the same thing. You need to uh, and I, I, and I, I, I disagree. I disagree with that social quote, but here's the thing. If you study the Luriana Kabbalah, I don't know how extensively... It's not just Luriana Kabbalah. It's in the text itself that they're talking about a Mitzvah de Rabbanon. They're not talking about one of the... I, 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 listen, listen. I, I, I fully understand that, and I'm telling you that I disagree with that Tosophist interpretation, okay? It's not just... I, that, but that's in the text itself. That's not just like the Tosophist. So you can't just keep saying you disagree and then dodging it. You actually have to address why they say this. Okay, uh, well... You know, I'd, I'd have to get I'd have to get back to you on that. I can tell you for now is that I disagree with that. I have enough evidence from other midrashim um, and other kabbalists saying and agreeing with that statement that the so, mitzvot of the Torah of Mount Sinai will be annulled in the future because the Mashiach will come and he will annul them. And it goes back to that understanding. It doesn't say it, it, it doesn't say it says that he will be. It doesn't say that he. What, it, what, what you'll find one midrash in midrash uh, midrash Mishlai that says that the only two yomim tevim that will be in the future will be in reference to. Uh, well, sorry, will be Yom Kippur, well, well, Yom Kippur and Pirim, but this is not talking about the annulment of the other Chagim and okay, so on and so forth that they will no longer, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, that's fine, that's fine, I, I want to, yeah, I want to, no that's be. fine. Okay, I, okay. We'll, we'll just have to, disagree. We'll, we'll have to disagree on that, but I, I want to come to, to the yeah. Luriana Kabbalah. If you, if you study the Luriana Kabbalah extensively, the, the Luriana Kabbalah talks also about these two Torahs and one being superior, one being inferior, and it talks about the different Torahs when the world was created through the 231 gates and things like that. Once again, so you, the idea of there being different Torahs, you keep interpreting this as this being different covenants. It's not. It's talking about different orders and different natures of how things are. Like I said, there is a Torah for every single thing you can you will see that there's tires sabram tires it's tires yakov and so on and so forth tires shaydim uh tires parnasa uh tires shemayim tires haaretz uh you know uh, there's a, even um you know tires asari tires abshat tires remez and so on and so forth there are different torahs for every single thing yeah but that's, not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not but that's not but that's not what the lirana kabbalah is talking about though that's it is ignorant. like you but, keep, but you keep is, assuming but, but, that it's talking about a different company well, you can't, okay that's so listen that sounds very ignorant because when the because when the lyrianic texts are talking about these different tours and stuff and these different universes these are different universes that it's talking about meaning that it's, it's not talking about, about different about transcendent when realms you, when you come back listen when you come to me and you tell me Oh, Torah Hashemayim, Torah HaAretz, all this stuff. That's regarding this universe. We're not talking about no, this universe. Not, We're talking no, about no, other no. universes. We're talking Shumayim about other universes. Is not, Shumayim, no, no, no. Shumayim is not a uh, part of this world. Shumayim is a part of Gan Eden, too, is not a part of this world. Gan Eden is a transcendent realm where only the soul goes. Same thing with Atzilus, same thing with Bria, and so on and so forth. For example, you go to a single Makobo, okay, go to any Makobo, go ask him, where is Oilam Ha'atzilus or Oilam Abriya? They'll say, all around you. That's not because Oilam Ha'atzilus and Oilam Abriya, for example, are physical places, but that's because of the fact that they are transcendent worlds, they are transcendent realms that are hidden behind a physical veil, okay? And then one may leave the physical veil and their soul may transcend to that place either dead or while they're still in their body okay i'm very i'm very i'm very well aware of that so the next point i want to make is the the luriana kabbalah uh, as is very well known by many who have studied it including scholars is is very gnostic okay and that's very important it is it is very important because um no, I'm saying it's, it's agnostic. Really, but but it is there's many points of it that are gnostic um okay and, what do you mean by gnostic like the idea of emanations yeah, that's one aspect. You know, emanations, that's ancient Gnosticism, right? That's why idea that there's an Gnostic, emanation. The Gnostic belief on emanations, they call this emissions, is that these things were like things which are co-eternal with HaKadosh Baruch co-eternal with Hashem, and so on and so forth, rather than Hashem being absolutely one, with nothing co-eternal to Him, or, you know, or, or, you know co-existent with Him, and so on and so forth. Whereas, you're not going to find a Makubo living or dead. And, I mean, really, if you've read the Ari, you will know what I'm talking about. It's very explicit in the Ari as well. Uh, that says that any of the spheres or anything which can be perceived in creation is co-eternal or co-existent at all or inseparable from a Kaddish Baruch in an essential sense. 
Okay, um, there are many there, there are many Gnostics that would agree with that position too. I mean, you're you're, you're the, it's the same thing. Yeah, this whole thing. With the Gnostics, like you can go into Irenaeus, uh, who recorded what the Gnostics believed. You'll find that they believed in these co-eternal emissions and so on and so forth. And you know, so no. Oh, there's different. There's different. There's different. There was clearly different sects of Gnostics, just like there's different sects of Kabbalah. You have a city Kabbalists. You have Shabbatian Kabbalists. You have Frankist Kabbalists. There's different sects. Just like those are those are those are just heretics. Like we don't. The only thing that we like for the different so-called sects of Kabbalah are not really like the only. Like for example, well, that's, that's, you could say that okay, there's. That's you could say that there's Makobale, you could say there's Makobale Vilna, but the only thing that we really de we, that we really disagree with the Makobale Vilna on is like whether or not Orange Safe really retracted or whether or not the like the uh, the retraction was meant was an allegorical. Um okay. otherwise no, we agree on most things. You can't call them quote different sects or like different schools well, of thought or whatever it is. Well, Name dropping Gnostics is a fucking way to like make yourself sound deep and intelligent, man. Okay. Continue uh yeah. So anyway, so the point that I want the point that I wanted to make was that the Liriana Kabbalah is very Gnostic. It's to me, it's it's it, you know, it's been very well studied and it's been proven by many scholars and other people who have studied that it's it's largely a derivative of, of ancient Gnosticism. And so one of the one of the, strong, one of one of one of the strong points, you know, again going back to the core of there being these two Torahs, one that's superior and one that's inferior, which is which is a large core of the Torah itself, right? Because there was two Torahs that were at play in the Torah, right? One was not given and one was given. And we know that the one that was not given was the higher superior Torah that Israel was not worthy of. So that begs the question of what is the nature of this concealed higher Torah that Israel did not have and that pertains to the Mashiach. Well, you know, in the Liriana Kabbalah, it starts discussing these inferiorities, right? Because, for example, you know, if you read Chaim Vital, if you read his Shar Hakadamoth, ha 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 his Gate Introductions, he says in there, he says, listen, you should not be studying the Talmud. The Talmud uh, is very inferior um, with respect to the Kabbalah. You should be quote studying, him. Your time quote studying him. Kabbalah. No, I'm saying quote him. You're saying that this isn't the Hakadama to Shar. The, wait, which? You're saying the Shar, you're saying, you're saying Shar Hakadusha, right? This is no. This is Sha'ar Hahakadamoth, Gate of Introductions. Oh, here. Yeah. So, in Gate of Introductions, in the beginning, Chaim Vital explicitly states. He says, "Listen, you as an Israeli Jew should not be studying the Talmud. You should be spending all of your time and energy um, studying the Kabbalah, and not the Talmud." Show me. Wait, Talmud. just just show me exactly what part of the Sha'ar that he says this in. It's like in the first. It's like in the first like fifteen pages of Sha'ar Hakadamoth. Okay, so there's so. You, so would be Shah Maim Ray Rashbi, which one? Like which Shah? No, I, I just told you it's Shahar Ha Ha Hakadamas. No, I, that, that's a part of that's a part of the Shah Hakadamas. Shah Maim Ray Rashbi. No, that's a gate. That, no, that's a gate. That's one of that's one of the gates of Chaim Vital. It's Shah Hakadamas. It's gate of introductions. If you go okay, and hold on, that hold on, gate, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, hold on. Which which part? Hold on. Let's see. Hold on. You're saying the first fifteen pages. Some, somewhere along the first 15 pages, maybe just do a search for Talmud, like the first instance of Talmud that you see in, in the text. I don't have, I only have, I have like a print, I have a printed uh, version. Sure, like a sure. thing. Um, I don't know if it's online, I'd have to look for it. But anyways, you can, listen, you can read it later, okay? Um, in there, he's very explicit. He says that you shouldn't be studying the Talmud because the Talmud is inferior to the Kabbalah. And he says, we all spend all of our time and energy studying Kabbalah and not the Talmud and the Halakha. And the re one of the reasons that is stated in Deliriana Kabbalah for this is because the gematria of Talmud right. is, is Lilith. Okay, so the gematria of, of of Talmud is Lilith, and so what is taught in the in the in the very esoteric Lariana Kabbalah is that the 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 oral Torah, the, the Talmud, was given by Lilith. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you shouldn't study it, but it just means that it's an inferior thing that was given, and it's very it's an, it's very important to master it and to know it um, for reasons I don't want to get into. I can't find it. Is, that's fine. I, I can. I mean, we could maybe on the discussion later. I, I can send snapshots of it. Okay. I can look it up. But anyways, the whole point is that he's telling you, hey, the oral Torah is inferior, and one of the proofs and seals is that the gematria of Talmud is Lilith, okay? okay? Meaning that it was that it was given it was given by Lilith, which is the clip of Malchuth. Moreover, they also teach in the Liriana Kabbalah that the gematria of Sinai, of Mount Sinai, is Samael. And it was given at Mount Horev, which is the Mount of Destruction. Moreover, the Torah in Gematria is equal to Samael plus yeah. Lilith. So all these things are learned in the Liriana Kabbalah, and, it, it, and it's all pointing to the fact that this Torah that was given on Mount Sinai is inferior because it was given by Samael, because Sinai is Samael. Talmud is Lilith. 
Torah is Samael plus Lilith. Har Horeb is the Mount of Destruction. And this goes back to ancient Gnosticism, which also taught the same thing. Because they too taught that uh, it was they Samael the and Levis and Torah. Torah. So it's 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 there in Deliria and Kabbalah. So this whole this whole dichotomy, okay, between these two Torahs is a core essence of what is revealed in the Zohar, in Delirian, and in Delirian Kabbalah, and even in the higher levels of the Kabbalah, like Shabbatanism and Frankism. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe yeah. you about that at all because <laughs> like you can the Yeah, yeah. I'm muting these damn people. No, I don't believe you at all because um, you, know, you can go into the Alizal, you can go into Rabbi Chaim Vital. I mean, once again, go into any Sefer Gabal, you can go into the Ramak, you can go into um, uh, you can go into um, the Ramsal and so on and so forth. You're going to find um, that in every single place they say that the keeping of mitzvah, shmiras, and mitzvahs, and so on, you can actually you know what, go and open the Kitei Halachis by Rabbi Nosson the Talmud of Rabbi Nachman Olav Shalom. Right? You can also look in. Um, you can also look in the Talas Pisa Chochma from the Ramchal and so on and so forth. Every, each and every single place they teach, right, that the keeping of the mitzvahs, the keeping of the Torah and so on and so forth, without these things, the universe would cease to exist. Why? Because we don't learn this just from the Zayn and but we also learn the Gemara itself. Hold on. We learn the Gemara itself. We, we, we learn the Gemara itself, right, that the entirety of the world was created in the Chochma as according to Sefer Mishlai Mipi Shlame but the thing is, is that we also learned that the Chuchma in of itself is the same as the Torah. It is the complete, is the complete exact same thing as the Torah. And without the keeping of the Torah, the world itself would cease to exist. Even the Arizal himself says, as well, according to Rabbi the Arizal, of course, as, as well, and Rabbi Chaim that the thing is, is that uh, if right, the, that the oil, that the oil in of itself is not just talking about this world, the physical world, and so on and so forth, but it is also talking about the four different worlds of Atzadis, Bria, and so on and yeah. so forth. You keep I, I, reinterpreting, I, I, you keep reinterpreting, I, I don't believe you about the, uh, some else thing, but I, I, I just don't believe you, because I, the, the, the Rabbi Chaim Bittal says the complete opposite, but, you know, you can send no, me No, no, I, I will, I will, I will, I, later words, I will show you the, I'm telling you, I've read it, it's explicit, I'll send, I'll send you the text later on, but listen, I understand what you're saying, and I think, I think there's a, um, a misunderstanding, right, because, I do not believe that all the Torah, you know, is done away with, or that all the Torah is annulled. Yeah, but even a idea. single part, like just even a single part, it doesn't matter. It like uh, uh, even a single mitzvah, even a single like that, letter. And, 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 and that's fine. But there are many, like I said, there are many Jewish sources speaking of when the Mashiach comes, there will be a modification to the Torah. Yeah, I'm gonna say that the entire yeah. Torah will be annulled, but that there's going to be modification. That's the whole there's, point. There's there's not, so the sources that you keep citing don't establish a modification. Regarding a greater revealed Torah, regarding the subject of a greater revealed Torah, you're going to find, as well, for example, one of the sources, one of the uh, psukim that I cited, it says, the hidden things are from Hashem You go to that psukim and you can find what the different Mekobalim say, and the Sezaira Kaddish, and so on and so forth, and you will find that they, that, that what, 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 is it, what does it mean, the stars, mighty stars, what, you know, what does it mean, hidden things? It is talking about that which is to be revealed, that which is, you know, the greater, you know, that which is greater revealed in Shumayim and so on and so forth, but is still one with the Taira. That that Taira that is in Shumayim is, well, that Taira that is, you know, in Shumayim is already the one that is Al Haaretz, is the, is the same one that is upon the earth. And that, and that nearly the greater, hold on, hold on. And that the thing which is going to be revealed in Yemei Mashiach is the greater understanding as to why we keep these mitzvahs. Not, for example, that we will stop keeping the mitzvahs and so on and so forth, but why we do, what happens if we sure. don't, and so on and so forth. That we um, will see the different worlds. We will like we will transcend, like we did at Har Sinai. We will transcend in our uh, in our we will transcend in our bodies and so on and so forth, and we will see. Uh, the different world, you will see Oyelma Atzilus, Oyelma Bria, and so on and so forth, and we will see the effects of human beings when they do not keep mitzvahs, when they commit a virus, and so on and so forth in those worlds, and what happens when uh, we keep the mitzvahs, you know, the things, you know, the the opposite of Sitra Acha, Sitra Ataiv, and so on, or, you know, the Yetzir Ataiv will increase in these worlds, and, and so on and so forth, and uh, more more schus will come to Gan Eden as a result, and this is also, this is established in, specifically, Kesar Shem Tov, like I said before, about Baal Shem Tov, where he says that he was informed, specifically in Shumayim, when he transcended, that the keeping of the mitzvahs in Shumayim causes, right, you know, causes miracles to happen in the heavens, meaning it, in Gan Eden, specifically in the Garden of Eden, that the world of Ganai, the highest parts of Gan Eden are literally affected um, in the highest sense by the prayers of simple people and by the keeping of and by the keeping of mitzvahs and so on and so forth in a good way. So, 
we've already I listened. We have we we, we share I, we share a, uh, just, we share a common understanding, just not a full understanding. But listen, I I understand your position, and you know it's it's kind of a bad position for most Jews in that there are major contradictions in our Jewish writings. How you have certain Rabbanon saying the Torah will be eternal, you have other Rabbanon saying no, it's going to be annulled when the Messiah comes. You, you don't. Come. You don't. Here, I'm just. I'm just, I'm just I'm Avi, I have to correct you on this. You don't. What you do is that you keep looking at individual statements and then you reinterpret them based on whatever you're thinking. But I'm, but so, I'm not reinterpreting I, I, I'm interpreting them. I'm interpreting them. Like, one of the big things, no, the big things you keep trying to do is that you, keep, is that you take a Braisa and you try to make it into a Machlaikas. No, I'm, 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 actually, I'm actually very simple. I'm just going for very simple common sense interpretations. The problem you're with you is that you keep on running the problem with you. You keep on running the problem it goes again. Wait, just hold on. It just goes against the. It has to stop because it goes against the Tanakh. You're saying common sense, yeah. common sense, common sense. But, but what you keep calling common sense is just presupposition. That's just it's just baseless presupposition. Well, when you find problem. statements, hold on, just hold on, hold on. When you find statements in the Russian, when you find Baraisis and so on and so forth, which say that you know, for example, Shia will bring something new. Once again, this is not talking. Like I said about, I'm, you can go to Taisvis, you can go to Midrashim, you can go to where any of these things are said. You will find the newness is not the is not. Like some sort of new law or new hooking mishpatim and so on and so forth. The newness is two things: one, the perfection of the people to keep these laws and so on and so forth, and the knowledge of the law. Either actually, it's actually new. Wait, 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 wait. That the newness of the law is one, the perfection of the keeping of the law, and two, the increase of knowledge among among the people of the world, among Am Yisrael and so on and so forth, of the different worlds, of reality, and of the relation of the Torah to the rest of creation, how it is one with the rest of creation, what happened, you know, the good and evil, and what is beyond good and evil, and so on and so forth, and direct knowledge of the Lord and Saif, which is, in its essence, is the same as Torah. So the thing is, is that you don't find, you keep saying common sense, common sense, common sense, but if you really had common sense, you would read the rest of the sources you're citing, like Yermiel 31, and you would find that it says that this new breeze, that this new covenant, the newness of it is that it will be remembered onto the hearts of the people and so on and so forth, and that it says immediately afterwards that if these laws, if these laws are annulled before me, if these okay. laws are annulled before me, right, then okay. I'm just going to cease to be a nation before me. Secondly, okay. I just want just one final thing, I'll let you go. In the Yerushalmi, but what any and this and this should go even if any of the Madrashim, God forbid, did actually mean to say that laws will truly be abolished in the future, right? Instead of instead of in the sense like, not, like as in a, in a real abolishment, not an abolishment which is allegorical or an abolishment which has more context than what you would suggest and so on and so forth. But even if any of the Madrashim actually did mean that this statement from the Yerushalmi supersedes all of them. Why? Because this statement from the Yerushalmi comes from the mouths of prophets who did not receive something from the Bosco, but received it Hashem himself from the from the voice of Hashem himself. Now, you have in the Yerushalmi, it's quoted by the Ramban, that it says, the Anshe Knesset HaGadoyla. Anshe Knesset HaGadoyla were 70 prophets and 40 sages. Okay, 40 the companions of the prophets. Mordechai, you know, Mordechai wanted to establish the reading of Megillus Esther as a mitzvah. Why? Because Hashem told him to. And so all of the Nevi'im became worried and said, how, you know, how dare Mordechai do this? How dare Mordechai come and say that he should add something new into the Torah? This is blasphemy, this is cure, and so on and so forth. But then Hashem eased their minds and he revealed that Moshe Rabbeinu had already demanded in the Torah, right? he had already demanded in the actual written Torah itself, that the Megillus Esther be read on Purim, that it actually be read on Purim as one of the 613 mitzvahs eternally. So the thing is, we see the Nevi'im, and Hashem HaKadosh Baruch allowed them, HaKadosh Baruch told them to, objected to the idea of what could possibly be an innovation in the Torah, which would be Ad Oilam, which would be eternal, instead of a mere minor fixation. Well, as Hashem revealed to them, the reason why it is eternal is because it was already said in the Torah Shabbat itself. It was already said in the written Torah and so on and so forth. Hence, the reading of, of the Megillus Esther is Ad Oilam, meaning it is eternal. So, you already have Nevi'im, the prophets themselves, with the voice of Hashem, with Ruch HaKadosh upon them, saying that no new thing can be added into the Torah. It's also said in Tamir 16a, as I already said before, Shmuel Hanavi, Shmuel, the prophet, the prophet Samuel himself, same as Pinchas, both said that there will not be new things in the Torah and that no prophet is allowed to addition anything into the Torah. Yeah, we're not talking about prophets, but we're talking about the Mashiach here. There's a big difference. Which and what I find is that... Listen, I've, I've given you a lot of time to talk, and you sometimes interrupt me and, and you cut me off, but, you know, what I find is that most Jews who, whenever they read anything that's very literal and, and pretty, you know, has a common understanding to it, and it contradicts what they hear. Let's give you the time to talk. And then it, it, contra and it contradicts, you know, what they've been taught. They then go to try to do a bunch of exegetical 
gymnastics to try to reconcile what what they're reading, you know, or trying to understand because it's contradicting what they've been taught for so long, right? If you've been taught for so long, oh, the Torah is eternal, and then you read a, a very common thing in the Talmud where you have a rock saying, hey, in the time to come, the Torah is going to, you know, the Torah is going to be, you know, abolished by the Mashiach. You're like, uh-oh, this contradicts what I've been taught for over 20 years. It, that's been so ingrained in me. So now I have to try to do exegetical gymnastics that's to try to reconcile and reinterpret it in a different light that, you know, um, you know, uh, doesn't contradict what, what, what I've been taught and, and, what, and what I believe in. And so that's what I find with many Jews, because there's many, many sources. I mean, there's many, there's even, there's even, there's even passages in, in, in the Talmudim where you have the Rabbanon saying, when, they, when they're talking about, okay, what commandment is eternal? There's a passage in the Talmud, I came on the top of my head, where they're, like, they're talking about like three different things that are eternal. Like, like for example, they're saying, Megillat Ruth is eternal. And they say, well, this other commandment, oh, that's eternal. Why, why are the Rabbanon discussing like three or four things that are eternal? It, with respect to the Torah, what about the other mitzvot? What about the other stuff? Because they're eternal. They're, they're eternal? They're no, because they're not eternal. The, 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 the implication is that those things are not eternal. Oh, so it's not Ruth, it's Esther, because it's Esther. Esther. No, it's that, no, no, you keep saying that that's the implicate. Like, for example, you just accuse other Jews of reinterpreting things when that's exactly what you are doing. You are not interpreting things or you're not understanding them within the bounds of the Messiah or even within the bounds of the very simplistic complex, like, you know, context of the text that you're citing right now, right? And you're saying, oh, they're just reinterpreting it because, you know, they're, they're, it's going against what they were taught for 20 years. No, they're understanding it based on what the Chachumim actually meant. How do we know what, we, what they meant? Well, because I will, we I will. Uh, let me finish, I, let me finish, I, I, let me finish. We have very specific Messiah, very specific Messiah establishing the context of these things and so on and so forth. We're not just like going in with our own uh, personal interpretations or personal like hermeneutical principles and just changing things around and so on and so forth. Rather, we are looking them, looking at them in the fullness of their in the fullness of their context definitions and so on and so forth. And what the Chachumim actually meant, not taught by our own exegesis, but taught from their own mouths to from student to student and so on and so forth. You, for example, took not not the Talmud, not Midrashim, not. Sif Kabbalah, not Sifra Rishonim, not Sifra Acharein, and not Sifra Gerayim, or Sifra Tanayim, etc., or Sifra Amarayim, or Sifra Sivarayim. You took the Mikra, you took the Tanakh itself, you took the literal written text itself, and you reinterpreted that, saying it's a common sense interpretation. But your common sense is an assumption. It is a presupposition. Oh, your common sense is an assumption. It's a presupposition, and not the personal, not the personal interpretations of Rabbanim or or of Jews today uh, mm -hmm. contradict you on this. The text itself contradicts you on this, where it literally says that these law laws will not be annulled, and that this new covenant, this Brisa Chadasha, will be this covenant which is better remembered onto the hearts of all of the people. Go read your Mirror Thirty One. You will find those exact words which I just cited. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, as well, is that you're seeing, oh, you find them saying that these different things are eternal. Oh, the implication is that other things are not eternal. You're making that up. Oh, it's a common sense interpretation. It, I call it common sense. It's like if I say two plus two equals six, that's common sense. Like, you have to actually bring sufficient evidence for what you're interpreting things as. You can't just say yeah, common have, sense so, and so on. And so okay, so, you're, so, so here's the thing, okay? So you're wrong because you are only doing everything through... Orthodox Judaism through the, through the Pharisee line. But the reality is that if you look at the ancient Jewish Gnostics, you had some of the greatest Rabbanon that were Jewish Gnostics, you had the Essenes, and those are very long, thousand year lines of transmission. Those are Rabbanon. No, these are, these are <laughs> thousand lines. These are thousand lines. The Essenes did not have a long? single Messiah. They did not have a single Shal Shal Sekabala. Even the Essenes, I will quote them for you, the Essenes themselves literally admitted in the Damascus document, and not in the one that's preserved in the Cairo Geniza, the one that was literally found right and you know among the dead sea scrolls and so on and so forth so you can't claim it's some sort of rabbinic change they would literally call the perushim they were called the pharisees the princes of judah and they admitted that they would go around and not not they the perushim but they themselves the essenes would specifically deviate from the perushim to distinguish themselves from them and even profess that they had the messiah with them and so on and so forth but deviated because they said that they misunderstood exactly. it because they couldn't transcend and so on and so forth but you're not going to show me a single shell you're not going to show me a single chain of transmission okay. between the essenes and harsini or even anybody before them like you no, can't wait, show wait, me that Okay, so once again, you interrupted me and you didn't let me finish my point, okay? I've given you, I'm being very patient with you and I'm going to finish you all your points. I am barely interrupting you and you're constantly interrupting me, okay? Listen. That's absurd. Let's let it so, talk, okay? So, so listen, you're coming from the viewpoint of the, the, the Orthodox Jews, which claimed a line of transmission back to the Pharisees. The point that I want to make to you is that there are other long ancient lines of Jewish transmission, like the Essenes, which the Kabbalists belong to, 
and knowledge yes. as well. Okay, so these are these yeah. are other ancient lines of truth. No, you don't. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I have to. Listen, if you don't want to believe that, that's fine. You don't have to believe that. I'm, no, no, I'm it's not, not that I don't believe it. It's 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 literally it's it's a, it's a lie. You literally go into any say, say for example, actually go into the Ramban. The Ramban was one of the biggest mukabbalim of his time. You also go on the Taisvis. Their Shalshos Kabbalah does not go back to the Essenes. Chash v'Shalom. They would have killed the Essenes. It goes back to Rav Nechunya Ben Hakona. It goes solely back to the to the Perushim. Secondly, that right that regarding that the ideas of transmission, we don't trace our ideas back to you know uh, you know We don't trace our ideas back to Chazal and stop there. Our ideas go all the way back to Har Sinai because we have the Hakdamas Arab. You have the Hakdamas mission taught by the Rambam. You have before him. You have in Seder Oilam, for example, the list of the different heads of the courts of. The among the Nevi'im and so on and so forth. You have Igeras, Rav Shuragan, you have uh, Sedatayim, Ve'amarayim, all establishing the person-to-person -person, thousands of different interlocked chains of transmissions going back to Har Sinai for all of the Tari Sheba Chsav and Tari Sheba Alpeh. The Essenes didn't have this. The Tzedukim didn't have this. The None of these groups have that at all, whereas we have well, an entire... That's, uh, that's, your, that's your opinion. That, that's just your... That's, that's your not your my opinion. opinion. That's it not is, my opinion. Is, that's an established fact for these Nukairis. The Essenes did not present a single chain. The Tzedukim did not present a single chain. The Peroshim are the only people with sufficient chains back to Harsinai. Not affirmed by one person, but affirmed by thousands in every generation. So I'm personally... So here's the thing. I'm personally very surprised that you are you claim to be an Orthodox Jewish Kabbalist because the Kabbalah is very heretical according to Orthodox Judaism, right? This no, whole it idea isn't. of ten yeah, it is. This whole idea of ten emanations is contrary to monotheism and also No, the it Kabbalist isn't. Things. You don't understand. I will read I I'm interrupted. This is this is just I have to interrupt you because it's just absurd. You've not read Kalach Bishra Chuchma. You have only learned of Kabbalah, not from the actual works themselves. You have learned of them from the misinterpretations, the purposeful reinterpretations of secular academics regarding Kabbalah. You go into Kalach Bishra Chuchma and you find from the Ramchal. What does he say about the Asura Spheris? The Ramchal specifically establishes that the Asura Spheris are created, that they are Nivra, that they were made, lit, that they were created, and that Hashem instantly transcends them, and that they are not. Oh, no, stop, 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 stop. Hey, 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 wait, 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 wait. That they are not co-eternal with him in any sense and account of being created. You also go into the Tanya. What does the Tanya say? The Tanya says that the Tanya quotes Sikin and it says meaning that Shem, right, and his Garmo and his you know meaning his actions are one, meaning Hashem has no attributes and he and his and he and his attributes are his essence and so on and so forth. Not a okay. single say for Kabbalah. Not a, you actually find Sefer Kabbalah which is saying that Hashem has no attributes on account of the fact that everything in him is one and the same. The Zayar Kaddish also says, Kaddish Barichi, sorry, Bakid, you know, Bakadisha, etc. It says that the Zayar says, right, in the Holy One, blessed be he, everything is one and the same. You the Asadis Spiritus is not contrary to monotheism. We don't consider the Asadis Spiritus ten parts in Hashem's essence or even ten distinctions. We consider them created emanations, all different reflections of refractions of the Horain Okay. You don't understand Kabbalah. You don't understand my Simmer You don't know any of these things. Okay, Do no, not listen, project I, I, the understanding I, you got okay. from the idiot Gershom, Shalom, and Moshe Edel. Wait, you're, 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 you're jumping to too many conclusions, Joseph. You're jumping to many conclusions and making assumptions, okay? I'm that not. When, you are. You are, but you are. No, I'm not because I'm not. No, you're not listening. You're not understanding and listening to what I'm saying. You're talking so fast that you're not able to just be calm and listen to what I'm saying, okay? And then you're interrupting me, so you're not letting me finish my I'm point. Not, because so I, I already know what you're going to say. You, and how, can you, how can you understand me when you're talking all fast? You're not because listening Because I've heard these claims maybe thousands of times in my life, yeah, but, but, and but, I know exactly what's going on in the back of my head. Listen, but you didn't let me finish my point because you're attacking me ignorant. Finish your point, and it's going to be exactly what I said. Finish your point. Wait, finish, let, all right, let, let me finish my point. Okay, I never said that. I, I'm not. I'm not the one that's saying that. Oh, the, the ten emanations are not co-eternal. But I understand everything that you said. Okay, and and I would tend to agree with that. Okay, the issue is is that real Orthodox Jews, real Orthodox Jews teach and claim that no. the Kabbalah is extremely heretical because it's not. It, it goes against ancient Jewish monotheism, and also many Kabbalists over time changed the halacha. You can see this. No, they didn't. No, the Zayda Kaddish didn't change halacha. You keep mistaking a bunch of things and confusing them with each other. The I'm Shulchan not, Arach, not. the Shulchan, wait, 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 the Shulchan Arach uses the Zayda Kaddish not as a place which you can derive, like, so come from. You don't paskin by the Zayda. No, actually, none of them are going today. No, not not ever passed on by the Zayr. But you can use the Zayr as secondary evidence, right, for supporting a claim about something which should be a psakadin. 
Rather, when you when it, when it comes to using the zayir for evidence on halacha, right, as something to paskin by, you don't paskin by it. Rather, there were certain there are different minhagim and so on and so forth, not among just mikubalim, but among bnei yisrael at the time, right, that the shulchan aruch was authored. And you may use the zayir kadosh saying, okay, this is evidence that we may hold by this minhag that this is evidence that you know we may hold the minhag is legitimate or illegitimate, necessary, or necessary, and so on and so forth. Not that you could go into the Zayat HaKadosh itself and say, here is a halacha, here is something the Zayat HaKadosh says, we will now pass in by it. The Zayat HaKadosh sometimes hold differently, right, than the, the, it holds differently than the Gemara, but that is not what we hold by. We don't hold by the Zayat HaKadosh, we only use it for secondary evidence for an already pre-existing minhag. To, uh, before and that, we read uh, that's, that's fine, you can tell that to the Orthodox Jews, but they would just they would disagree. All I'm saying is... No, they would, you're not, and first of all, you're not, you don't know, what, I'm just, I have to interrupt you because you just don't know what you're talking about. Like you, you are deceiving all these people, and you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't read, you haven't learned the Shulchan Aruch at all. You haven't sat in the yeshiva and learned at all. If you sat in the yeshiva, I mean, really, just like sit there for like five days, go in the Shulchan Aruch, go in the Torah, and so on and so forth. Go and but find actually, a single but place. Actually, but here's, but here's the problem. Actually, I did study yeshiva all my life, and what I found was that most of the Jewish rabbanon are extremely ignorant and blind. And no, you didn't. No, no you didn't. Because if you did, you would have known exactly time. what I'm talking about. This, this is like this is 101. This is the tour 101. Literally, like very basic. I don't. I don't believe you. I'm sorry. You don't, like, have, that's fine. You don't have to. Believe, you don't have to believe me. We're at odds, and it is what it is. But I'm telling you, trust me. There's higher Rabbanon that have a much greater understanding, and I'm, I'm just giving you the facts. Most or, real Orthodox Jews find the theology of the Zohar very strange, and the fact that it changed halacha over time very heretical. You and keep I know, saying. You and, just and keep I know, saying. I know. Listen. I know, is, listen, I know Orthodox. I, I can I can direct you to websites in Israel of actual. You can direct me to Rabbanon. David Bar Chaim, David Bar Chaim, who's been called a kaifer by most people. You can direct me to Nasan Slifkin, Nasan Slifkin, who was literally put on harem and multiple rabbanim literally called him a min, meaning an atheist. You're not going to direct me to the actual Messiah itself. You're not going to direct me to the actual Svodim itself, which say that one, the fetus are not coeternal to Shem. They're not distinctions in the Shem Chas Sholem. The Aliza said, if anybody believes in any multiplicity in the Shem. Let him be damned. You know, that literally says, "Let him be damned." According to Rabbi same thing with Rabbi Chaim Vital and so on and so forth. Okay, um, I, I, you will I, find that the yeah, spirits are not multiple things within Hashem. They're not different things within Hashem and so on and so forth. Like I said, they are created emanations. Nobody, nobody says that the Zayar Kaddish ever changed halacha at all. It was only used as secondary evidence. Why? Because the Zayar Kaddish is a midrash. Just as midrashim, just as midrashim that are not included with the sifra and the sifra and so on and so forth, midrash agada can be used to support a minug, but not cannot be passed by the zayar kaddish was also used to support different minhagim, but not passed by as secondary evidence. Like I said, you did not go to yeshiva. If you were in yeshiva and you learned the tour, you learned the shulchan aruch, etc., and you came across a part where it mentions the zayar kaddish, the person teaching you and the actual text itself will say, oh, "No, you know, we, uh, you, you ask them, we don't hold by the zayar kaddish, we don't pass by the zayar kaddish, we use it as secondary evidence." You didn't well, sit yeah, in that, uh, uh, and, 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 and that's a demonstration of, of high ignorance. Okay, and and, 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 and I know, and I know, listen, and I know that you're not going to understand that, and that's fine. We just have to skip. Okay. Secondly, so you you don't consider you don't you you don't consider Hasidus quote Orthodox Judaism. Is that true? No, there's a, there's 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 a, there's a large uh, there's large contention between Hasidic Jews and and the Mitna, the Mitnagadim. So the Misnagdim the Misnagdim did not. Okay, what was the contention between Misnagdim and Hasidim? Tell me. I mean, I don't know. There have they have many contentions. So I, you don't know. Okay, I don't, just name one. I don't name really one. Care. Name one. I mean, well, one of them is pantheism. They think the Hasidic Jews are pantheists, and I think uh, no. You know, so the Vilna Gaon interpreted. So the Vilna Gaon interpreted one of the words of the Balatanya to say that, for example, the essence of Hashem entered into space and time. The Vilna Gaon did not. What the Vilna Gaon did not understand, and once again, we don't insult the Vilna Gaon. We as we as Hasidim today, we do not like say we do not like even put a cherem on, on the Vilna Gaon or any of his followers. Rather, we bless the Vilna Gaon and we say that he's, that he's one of the greatest that you know, one of the greatest that ever lived, one of the greatest saints who has ever lived. But he misunderstood something from the Balatanya. He thought that the Balatanya said that the, the essence of Hashem enters into space and time because of the fact that the Balatanya said that everything is the essence of Hashem, or you know, Einoid Niladoi, we mean that everything is united to Hashem in some way. But the Balatanya, in the same place, and also in Shari Yechidei says that Hashem's essence is in reality beyond and outside and infinitely transcendent beyond space and time. And he clarifies, and he specifically says, that everything, when, when we say that everything is one with Hashem, we merely mean that everything is an emanation or expression or microcosm of divinity. It is a microcosm or, or uh, shadow of Hashem, or mirror image of Hashem, if you will. Rather, Hashem's essence and his attributes, you know, and his essence is his attributes, are entirely unknowable, and he is the only thing which is created. 
So the thing is, is that, like I said, the, the sense in which Hashem's essence is in space and time, where everything is one with his essence, is that everything is an expression or emanation of his essence or an image of his essence and so on and so forth. As it says, and I say, I'm the you know, everything, you know, a man is made and, you know, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and so on and so forth. Not that his essence is actually directly within space and time, as my essence is within space and time. That was the misunderstanding of the Vilna Gaon. We as Jew, we as Hasidim today do not hold to the idea that Hashem's essence is directly in space and time. Rather, it is only in space and time by way of emanation, just as, for example, the Baskol or any other created thing is created emanation, of course, not by some like uncreated okay. Gnostic emanation. So, name so, another one. No, no, I want to I wanna make a follow-up point. So, to me, that's just a lot of semantics, but I'm, I'm, I, you kind of showed your ignorance because I'm an insider. You, you can't even you. refute what I said. You have to hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not, I, don't, I don't care to refute that. What I want to tell you is what the real, I want to tell you what the real hidden contention between the Mitna Gadim and the, Hasid, the Hasidim is, that you don't know because you're not an insider. The reality is that most of Hasidim are, 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 are concealed um, derivatives and emanations of Shabbatainism, okay? And if you First look at the yeah, Gainabi, talk to the Hasid right you, now. You're talking um, to somebody who has been a chassid all of his life. Yeah, but you're not an insider. You're not an insider at the top. No, nobody says this. I'm sorry. You're just making stuff okay. up. Yeah. Exactly. Of, course, of course, that's what you're going to say. But the facts are, because you don't know this, that the ma- the bloodlines of the major chassidim, um, you know, masters, were all, were all Shabbatian bloodlines. Especially that. Okay, no, they weren't. Chabad- no, they weren't. Chabad- no, they weren't. Chabad- no, they weren't. Okay. wasn't. And there, was uh, also, there was also a lot of there was also a lot of Shabbatian masters that entered the Hasidic community concealed. You don't know this because you're not an insider, but I'm telling you this is a fact. Okay, okay. first of all, there were people, the, the only people, there are some like people today who are descendants of Sabbateans, but they repented and so on and so forth. There's no Rabbanim or Rebbeim who are descended from Sabbateans. Even if they were, like I said, even if they were, okay, they openly condemned Sabbateanism and Ahmadized it and refuted it. You can read, you know, Rabbi Sadiq Kaya, and you can read about what they say about Sabbateanism and how they refute the complete ideology in its entirety. Right now, you're just making assumptions and conspiracy theories about Rebbeim. You're not providing any evidence and so on and so forth. And you won't provide any evidence because it doesn't exist. Yeah. I, actually, 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 the evidence does exist, and I can provide you the genealogical lines. And even if you did, once you. again, you would have to prove that they even ever teach exactly. Sabbatianism. Okay. As usual, as usual, if I provide the facts, you'll always find some way to circle around it and reinterpret it. No, I say I already clarified it. and said I even if it did, even if it did exist, already you'd already actually know, have to prove that it's already it considered to be openly anathematized. It, 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 we continue to this day to openly anathematize it. So, yeah, exactly. There was a lot of Shabbatians that openly denounced it, but deep, but but secretly they maintained they maintained that belief in that order. I mean, you actually have to provide evidence that it still exists in Hasidim, regardless of so-called genealogy or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, that evidence, not all that evidence can be provided, but I can, I can show you the evidence that many of the many of the Chabad masters were all were all. Were all oh no, there are, there are a lot of Chabad Rebbeim. There's there are there are Chabad Rebbeim today who are descended from Sabbateans. I know, I've seen or descended from Frankists. I know, but they don't teach. Sabbateanism or Frankism and so on and so forth as, you know, yeah, as a... Of course, of, course, of course, of course, how stupid can you be? Of course you're not going to teach it openly. It's only for a few elite and elect that... Yeah, they, but they, you're they, just they, making an assumption. That's like me saying you're secretly a pedophile. Of course you're not going to say you're secretly a pedophile in public. You know, how do I... Of course you're not going to say you like child porn in public. Like, so, not, exactly. I'm making, listen, I'm making a point. Those those that are listening that, that know how know the real true game and the insight, they'll understand. Those that don't, they don't. It is what it is. I mean, you know, I'm, I can't I can't prove everything to you. I already... That's that's how it is. No, but you need to, like, uh, no, I, I'm not denying that there are still Sabbateans alive today. I don't think, however, that, a, that any of the Rebbeim are secret Sabbateans. If they are, you'd actually have to establish that with sufficient evidence. Like, you can go there. That's, that's, that's not, that's not, not going to be established because they don't want their identity blown. They're not going to It's be just your blown. assumption. I'm sorry. Like, if I went around, I like, you, that's like, you'd you know what? sue that's me good. for this. Like, I mean, like, you'd sue me for this, right? Like, if I went around saying, guys, Avi is a pedophile. He likes child porn. Um, of course she's not going to do it in public. What do you mean? I can't, I can't provide that evidence, but those who understand and know the game, know the game. Those who don't, they, you know, don't. Okay. That, that, that's just what it is. Like, I can't. Exactly. Like, I can't exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people understand how it, how it runs. Yeah. Of course. Just like the politicians. I don't know that politicians are secretly pet files, but they can't prove it. But they just, they know how, they know how the system. No, you can prove that John Podesta, I believe John Podesta is a pedophile. You can, you can, um. You can prove that John Podesta is a pedophile. Yeah, no. A lot of them you can just easily prove it's a pedophile. Yeah, I mean, listen, there, there are some people that would disagree with you and say you're a conspiracy Here, if you're in Epstein's, you know, I'll, I'll say this. If you're in Epstein's black book, you're having sex with kids. There. That's, that, that, that's, my, that's my standard. But there's yeah, no 17 everyone, black books. Everyone, so. everyone, everyone has a different standard, though. I mean, it's whether you have eyes to see or you don't. There's people that are just so blind. You can give them the facts. You can give them the facts and everything open for them, and they're sure not going to believe it or see it. That's just yeah, how it is. Yeah, like I said, evidence. You actually need evidence. I'm sorry. You're going to need evidence. 
Yeah. Exactly. I know it's very easy for you because you see it so clearly, but you you're not very empathetic. You don't understand how other oh, people. I, I will not support the idea. Yeah, I, I just it's just just not plausible at all. Like there were, I know that the like, Sabbateans, of course, would try to infiltrate communities and conceal themselves. That doesn't exist today among Rebbeim, among the, or among the Rebbe, the Rebbeim of Chassidus. If it does, you actually have to prove that they are really Sabbateans. But yeah, we're not. We're not. Our 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 mission and purpose is not to prove that. Well, I'll openly say it because of who I am, and I can. No one else is going to openly say it. No one else is going to reveal it. I'm not going to reveal it. You either know or you don't. I, I wouldn't even really consider you a Sabbatean. I actually, I call, I, I, you're like a neo Sabbatean. I actually don't even should call you neo Sabbatean. You're like, oh, you know, it's role playing basically. Yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a Frankist. That's a whole different category. So, no, do you know any Frankists who have lines of succession back to Frank who teach you things in private? Yeah, they're very high up. They're some of the most powerful, wealthiest people in the world, and some of the most powerful and wealthiest Jews in the world. The and so you've learned, you've learned under them, is what you're saying. Oh no! I come. I already told you. I come from a long, ancient rabbinical bloodline. No, no, no. I'm saying. Well, I'm saying. Do you learn from these Frankists with that Frankist succession back to Frank and Sabtai Tzvi and so on and so forth himself? Is that what you learn with? No, not really. Okay, so then you're like you're like a neo Frankist, yeah, or neo neo Sabbatean neo Frankist, yeah. I'm not a Sabbatean. I'm I'm a Frankist, is what I would say. Okay, then neo. I'm actually an ancient Gnostic Frankist. I follow neo Gnostic. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, I follow, I follow the ancient Gnostic teachings of the ancient Jewish Gnostics and Essenes. I mean, that's where I would put myself. And, and Jakob Frank and his movement was just uh, a rebirth of that. I, I, you, you know, also need, like, here's the thing, like, uh, uh, the, the actual Essenes today are the Mandaeans, because they actually have succession. You don't, I, I, you are um, an online person. I mean, you, don't, you don't believe, I mean, you don't believe we have succession, and that's fine, but I mean. No, no, I mean, like, you don't even try to establish it. Like, I can actually show you. Thousands of biographies, thousands of statements from every generation of the Jewish people since Har Sinai to now, in in an unbroken chain of transmission, like going all the way down to today, right? Of thousands of different figures, thousands of different students, like students and teacher relationships, and so on and so forth. Like all these different chains of transmission lineages. Hold on, hold on, hold on. But wait, but all these different chains of transmissions and chains of transmission and lineages. Like you actually cannot show me a single one between you and uh, honestly anybody even like the last century. Okay, let me let me let me make my point up here. The problem is that. You're not fully appreciating the esoteric tradition. You're so focused on the exoteric line of transmission and the exoteric line of tradition. I'm not talking about the. There's esoteric. also an esoteric. I'm talking about the esoteric. The, esoteric. Got, the, 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 the only reason, reason the listen, the, the only, okay, you keep on interrupting me. The only reason you're a Jewish Kabbalist is because part of the esoteric line of transmission, vis-a-vis -vis the Zohar, was revealed in the 13th century. If if, if the Before. grandmasters didn't do that, you wouldn't know any Kabbalah right now. Okay. Uh, no, because the Zayda Kaddish. Hold on, I have to correct you. Uh, no, the Zayd Kaddish. It's not. I, you're, you're just like you know making stuff up. The Zayd Kaddish, or before the Zayd Kaddish, there was still obviously a set of Kabbalah going back to Rav Nachman Yibn Akana. You can look at the Ramban, you can look at the Tzvi, you can look at uh, the Geonim, and you can look at the uh, teaching of. You can look at uh, Sefer Yichud, or is it Sefer Yichud, the, the, the Rav Haigan? You can look at. Um, Sefer I and the Rav Chamaigon and so on and so forth. And you're going to find this entire tradition of Kabbalah in every single century, from the Geonim to the Sevarayim to the Amarayim to the Tznayim to the Zigas to the Nevi'im and back to Har Sinai and so on and so forth of Kabbalah, both Kabbalah Balpeh and Kabbalah that is in the written form, you know, Shabbat and so on and so forth. Um, so you're not. Just, so, 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 and you can also, as well, you can even find before the revelation of the Zayr, you can actually find the Zayr to Kaddish was known to the Geonim, and it's quoted in many books by the Geonim. It's actually quoted in some Russian from the Amarayim and so on and so forth. It's just Perak of Yeshiyui. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, the Zayda Kaddish, uh, pre-existed, uh, its revelation, and it's certainly from the hands of Rashbi, etc., and no, of course, it was a Masoyed of Kabbalah long before the Zayda going all the way back to Harsinai. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fully in agreement with that. That's not the issue at hand, though. If you're saying the Zayda wasn't revealed, I wouldn't know any Kabbalah, even though there were already, like, books on Kabbalah being written long before the Zayda. Really? Yeah, one well, books on the Kabbalah room before the Zohar that all the Jews were studying and, and, and reading. Sefer Yichid, so Sefer Yichid, Sefer Bitochen, um... Uh, even actually, uh, uh, what is it again? Sefer Tzioni, Rav Tzav Yemi, um, what's the other one? Sefer Ian, so on and so forth. Uh, and I, I'm naming ones all, all aside from Sefer Yitzira, right? We can also go Sefer Abahir, right? Bahir was also written. There are other books, uh, that were written by Rav Nechonia Ben Akadna, and so on and so forth, and yeah. Yeah, but no, so none of the Jews, the, the, the vast majority, over 99% of Jews, 
did not have any Kabbalistic works prior to Oh, this actually, part. yeah. I mean, this is not true. Like, for uh, the, uh, even the Arizal says that, like, a lot, even, like, the lay people, even the lay people who weren't, like, they, they know halacha, they know, um, it, you know, they know halacha, they know the Gemara, and so on and so forth, but not to such a great extent as Tamidah Chachomim did. Even they, actually, among many of the lay people, they actually did have some sort of relation to Kabbalah and some some sort of relation as Baliyah Sayyid and so well, on yeah, and so forth. That's the whole, that's the whole point, listen, that's the whole point that I'm making. There was a, there was a few elect. Um, among the Jews that did have some secret books and had the secret knowledge, but 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 until well, you keep, I mean, keep changing your opinion, then. like yeah, so no, like I, even among the my point is even among the lay people, the oral tradition of Kabbalah was actually still being studied. Like uh, and you know this was a. Uh, what many people uh, feared would happen is that somebody like Sabtai Tzu would come around, he'd start twisting people, he'd start confusing them, and so on and so forth, and that's exactly what happened. So, I mean, like, you can't say, oh, this is exactly what I mean, okay. uh, even though what I'm saying is the opposite of what you're saying. Yeah? All right. I, I, all right. I, I don't know what else to tell you. I, I just, uh, you know, I said what I have to say, so I... I you know, okay. Yeah, you're not going to find a single midrash. I'm just going to I'm just gonna uh, finish up with this. You're not going to find a single midrash that says that... Um, the laws will really be abolished in the future. You're not going to find that. You will find that there's one, 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 literally one. Let me finish. Let me finish. You're going to find that there's literally one midrash that says, okay, that Yom Kippur and, and Purim will be abolished in the future. But then you actually look at the context of the midrash, and it's not actually saying that. It doesn't even say that they'll be abolished. It says they'll be nullified. But it's not even saying, for example, that they will actually be like they will actually be nullified as Hagim, or that when the army will no longer be like obligated to keep them. But that there's two things. One, the Pshat, the Pshat understanding is that Am Yisrael, like in a time of great oppression, will not be able to follow them. Okay, as in only the, the, will not be able to follow any of any of the Chagim because of the fact that people are preventing us from doing so, right? Uh, except for Yom Kippur and Purim, that Am Yisrael will never fail to keep Yom Kippur and Purim. And then the understanding of the soul, the understanding of the secret interpretation is that all of the Chagim will become one in Purim and Yom Kippur. And it will be continued to be kept, it's just that they'll be kept in some sort of mysterious way alongside Yom Kippur and Purim. There's no nullification mm -hmm. and abolishment. Rather, there is merely one, us being prevented temporarily, temporarily, not eternally, okay? Because okay. abolishment must be eternal, or, or like a, or a complete abrogation of the terror must be eternal in order for it to be abrogation. We'll only, be, we'll only fail to keep it temporarily, aside from Yom Kippur and, and, Yom Kippur and Purim itself, okay? And that they will all become unified and one with these two other holidays, but each of their practices will still be kept as distinct holidays and so on and so forth, so... Okay, so, um, you know, I, I've given some citations from the Talmud Bible, you know, that track trait, I think, in Edarim 61a, where you have a rap saying, you know, the mitzvah will be in all in the future. Yeah, but we already, we already uh, refuted oh, you right, on that. Let me, let me, let me, you said... Let me, okay, can you just let me finish my point? Let me just finish my point, okay? Keep it interrupting me. Let me just finish my point, okay? Uh, I let you finish all your points, okay? Just let me finish my point. I've given, I've give, I've, I've stated on the record, you have, you have a passage in the Talmud explicitly stating that this is going to be an all in the future. There's other midrashim that do so, okay? One final point, one very strong mystical final point that I want to make is that in the Talmud, it is taught that in the future, the Zadikim will feast on the flesh of Leviathan, which are Tananin, which are dragons, okay? This is another proof, right? We know that the, the flesh of reptiles, the flesh of, uh, of dragons is prohibited according to the Torah on Mount Sinai. You cannot, that's not kosher. Yet we have a passage in the Talmud saying, in the future, you, the Zaydi Kim, will be eating on prohibited flesh. And listen, there are other proofs, there are other hints. Some of, listen, some of the passages in the Talmud in our ancient Mirashim, they're not, ex, they're not always explicit. You don't always have a rap ex, as you do in, the, in one passage in the Talmud explicitly stating, hey, the Mitzvot are going to be along in the future. Sometimes they, they hide it, because this, this is very esoteric knowledge, so they hide it and they made hints. One powerful hint is that passage in the Talmud that says, oh, and by the way, in the future, the Zaydi Kim will be feasting on the flesh of Leviathan. But that's a very mystical passage. What other secrets is being revealed in that mystical passage Besides the fact that kashrut will be annulled in the future, it doesn't right? say that kashrut will be annulled. Hold on, okay. hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, let me is let not finish. considered. Wait, 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 let him, let him finish this point. Uh, this is not true. Really. Okay. okay, so my, my my last final point then is then I then I take you to the Tanya, right, and I take you to that epistle where again we're getting back to that core teaching of the two Torahs, the inferior Torah, the superior Torah. This is just a very common basic teaching from the Torah. You also find it in the New Testament as well, right? This is an ink that, you know, Shaul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He sat under the feet of Gamaliel. He's giving this teaching about the superior Torah, the inferior Torah. Oh, in this is some he Christian. Well, no, he was a Jew. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees who studied under the feet of Gamaliel. So he's but it's, a, it's an apostate Christian. Okay, well, let, me, let me just, let me, let me just finish, let me just, let me just finish my point, okay? Garbage. So you have, you have a Jew 
who's, who's, who's called by all of Israel at that generation, uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees who sat under the feet of Gamaliel, when he's giving this, when he's giving this teaching in the New Testament, he says, listen, I'm giving you a very high level Jewish teaching that only Jews will understand. You have the Gnostics teaching this. You have the Shabbatines teaching this. You have the Frankists teaching this. You have ancient Gnostics teaching this. You have the Essenes teaching this, right? So you have so many Jewish lines of transmission, so many Jewish Shabbatons yeah. teaching what I'm teaching right now about the superior Torah, the inferior Torah, tree of life versus tree of Da'at. You know, commandments will be annulled in the future. You have all of these Jewish, ancient Jewish Ramadan, modern Jewish Ramadan, you have all this evidence, and it all stands against that one single, you know, Pharisaical Orthodox Jewish line of transmission. So that's the point. That's how I want to summarize, you know, and how I want to make my final point of the debate. I provided tons of evidence from the ancient Gnostics, the 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 the, the Jewish Paul of the New Testament, the Essenes, the Shabbatim to Frank. Okay, I get it. Entire, Listen, man. All this, okay? Going against what you have to say, yeah, okay? okay. No, here's the thing, right? First of all, Paul, you said he was called a Pharisee of Pharisees by the people of that generation. Paul was somebody who claimed to be a student of Gamaliel. Whether or not he was wasn't really a concern to me. This was one guy who apostatized from his who apostatized from Judaism and became a Christian, and then said that he, and then you know pretended for exe he missed. He, he makes the idea of you know uh, the Sadducees and the Torah. He makes the idea of secrets in the Torah and so on and so forth with his own presuppositional interpretations. Um, this was an irrelevant figure in history. The only relevance that he had is that his followers used his writings to subjugate Jewish people and so on and so forth. Paul did not actually teach any substantial, you know, Messiah. He didn't really teach anything that was any of like any value, authenticity in the Messiah itself. You can't actually prove that the Jews called him a Pharisee of Pharisees at all outside of his own words. Uh, we have nothing in any uh, piece of history mentioning him. In fact, the only uh, historical sources at his time mentioning him would be, um, one, his own writings, and two, Christian literature. Otherwise, that's it. Like I said, this was not somebody who was called a so-called Pharisee of Pharisees. You're citing a source which is just completely irrelevant that's in light of the Messiah, irrelevant in the line, so on and so that, forth. Regarding that's the fine. idea, regarding, yo, stop, stop, stop. Regarding the idea of annulment of command, annulment of mitzvahs in, uh, in the in the Gemara that you mentioned, the same place that it's, it's the same place in the Sechus Nadarim where it's talking about this. It's talking about a mitzvah the Rabban. It's talking about a rabbinic commandment. It's not talking about the commandments that were given at Har Sinai. A rabbinic commandment is a takana, meaning a rabbinic, a rabbinic commandment is a decree or a fixation that is inherently temporary. It is not me'olam al le'adolam. It's not from eternity to eternity, like the Torah is. In order for the commandment of do not add to nor diminish from to be violated, and this is said by all the Mephorshim, this is said by the Gemara itself, in order for it to be violated, you have to remove something eternally, and you have to add something eternally, or you have to do something outside a minhag or a takana. And both a minhag and a takana are not to level the Torah, they are both temporary. They are not They are not eternal whatsoever. So the thing is, is that you keep, re you, you've done this again, this is about the fourth time you've done it with the same source. You keep reinterpreting the source to fit your interpretation with your own presupposition. I've already established to you that the majority of sources within the Nevi'im themselves say that there will not be additions or subtractions in the Torah, and that the Torah in of itself will remain eternal um, with nothing added or removed from it. And the only thing which, uh, when the only thing that can exist alongside the Torah that is not given a Harsinai would be a Takana. And once again, a Takana is not eternal, hence it doesn't violate, do not add to, nor diminish from. You can say, all the couples know this, all the couples know this, all the couples know this. And like, no, none of them Kobolim say that there's going to be some sort of new Torah which, which supersedes this one. All the Kobolim say that the Chukim, the Mishpat, and the Mitzvahs, and so on and so forth will remain as they are, and there will be no eternal change at all. So well, I provided. I provided. You also said also, you also you said a bunch of Jewish. You know, you didn't provide a single source. You also said a bunch of. Okay, that, that's fine. Can you please answer me when I gave when I said it that that sugya from the Talmud about the Zadikim feasting on the flesh of of of. Oh yeah, I was gonna answer that. Yeah, that's what the Leviathan is like I said. The Leviathan is made an exception because the fact the Leviathan is not considered among the is not considered among the other serpents. Yeah, this is actually this is this is an old kasha which has been answered a long time ago. The Leviathan of itself is literally considered its own species beyond beyond the uh, serpents of the earth and so on and so forth. Hence, it was permissible to eat them. And even if it was impermissible, a takana will be made. A takana would have been made at that time, right, in order to make it permissible to eat it. But the takana mm -hmm. of itself would not be eternal. It would not be a new mitzvah. It would not be uh, a, a subtraction of another one and so on and so forth. It would only be for that time only. But we see there's no need for a takana because of the fact that the Leviathan is not considered among the serpents of the earth. Whereas uh, the serpents of the it's considered its own species, yeah. Okay, so this is like the one hundred time that you that you do exegetical gymnastics to try to reconcile. You keep saying exegetical gymnastics. You keep saying exegetical yeah, because, gymnastics. Because, because you keep on doing. You, you keep need on to doing actually. Wait, wait, wait. 
I'm not doing exegetical gymnastics. I'm establishing to you what the Messiah says. I'm not using my own interpretation. You're using your own interpretation to interpret the Gemara and so on and so forth like a Christian, like literally. Like you don't understand the idea of nuance at all. Let him reply. Let him reply. Listen, but he needs to just, stop saying that stupid exegetical gymnastics thing, like literally, because it's well, okay. But you keep on saying, people. listen, you keep on, listen, you keep on saying a lot of stupid stuff, and you don't let me reply, and you keep on interrupting me. Okay? I mean, because your eyes are blurred. I want to let uh, listen, I'll, I'll be talking, then we, and then you right, reply so, extensively after he talks. So, so, so here's another point that I wanted to make. Right? We have two very famous Jews of antiquity, Paul, and we have Rab Akiba. Right? Paul, there was Rabbi. two, there, there was two Mashiachim. Um, in, in antiquity that were very famous. We have Bar Kokhba and we have Yeshua, right? We have two very famous uh, rabbis, Shaul and Rabbi Kiba, right? Now, well, Shaul, well, he's not a rabbi. Wait, I'm going to stop you. Show me who, who ordained him. You keep on, okay, you keep on, you keep on interrupting me. Gabriel, yeah, you in the keep saying like absurd stuff. Like it just listen, needs if to you stop. want to reject, if you want, listen, you keep on interrupting me. If you want to Show reject me that he was a rabbi. Scholars, Listen, if you want to, if you want to continue to reject a, a bunch of the scholars and, and scholarly written stuff, that's your, that's your, okay? Scholar the reality, was he, what? Wait, wait, how about, oh, how, how, how about you, you just, you know, just let me finish my point, okay? You can respond afterwards, okay? You, you can say everything you want to say afterwards, okay? The reality is that no, most of the world would agree on this, okay? Is that Shaul was one okay. of the famous rabbis of antiquity, okay? Who, who many Christians follow. He studied under, he was, he was, um, simchad by Gamliel, okay? He's very famous on the same level as Rabbi Kiba, okay? Show me, the, really, show me the source that says that he was ordained. Okay, show me the source that says that he was ordained. Okay, you keep on how, about you, how about you, 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 you reply extensively to everything he said after he finishes saying? He needs Just to like, show me the source that says he was ordained. Okay, oh, okay just, then just, ask him for that after he finishes his point, like he lets you talk. Yeah, I let you talk, so just, just relax, okay? Let me finish my point, okay? Oh, no, I'm telling you, listen, you you may not believe this because you're an Orthodox Jew, but the rest of the world has no problem believing this and believes this because there are a lot of scholars and historical sources proving and corroborating this, okay? Just because you're anti-Christian um, and, and don't see it and want to be close by it, that's on you, okay? But you got the, you got the whole world against you on this, okay? And you got multiple I don't care. historical sources... I think exactly you can say that, okay? So the point well, is that you have, historical stories, I need right, it. Just just, no. let, just let me finish, okay? Just just let me finish. So you have you have this famous Rab Shaul who believed in you know Yeshua as the Mashiach, and you have Rabbi Kiba who believed in Bar Chukba as the Mashiach, right? So you here you have two of the most famous rabbis of antiquity, both believing in a different Mashiach. Now, what I don't understand is all the Jews, they know and they understand that Rabbi Kiba, as great as a Mechabah as he was, he goofed big time by believing in Bar Chukba being the Mashiach because he was a false Mashiach. Shaul also believed that Yeshua was the Mashiach. He led a huge religion called Christianity. All the Christians follow him. Some Jews follow him too, okay? And yet the Jews will reject Shaul and all his teachings. They won't study his teachings even under an open mind. It's fine if you disagree with Shaul and you're not a Christian, but he was a very famous ancient Jew. And so you should have an open mind. You should study what he has to teach and say because it's very important to understand ancient Judaism because they're doing, they do that with Rabbi Kiva. Well, Rabbi Kiva was a famous Mechabo. He, he was a famous Jew, a rabbi. We're going to study his teachings and his writings even though he goofed and believed in a false Mashiach. Oh, but with Shaul... Oh, but we won't do that with Shaul. He too believes in a false Mashiach. Okay, so hey, you know what I'm going to ask you, Are you just going to like uh, keep saying like this ignorant stuff? All right, well, I'm done with my point. Go ahead. You can respond as you wish. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva did not say that Bar Kosiva, Bar Kosiva, Bar Kochba was like Mashiach Mamish. He was saying oh, he was 100% the Mashiach. Bar, uh, Bar, uh, Rabbi Akiva held two things one, that he was Mashiach Adair, and two, that he was Nachshiv Mashiach. And before you say, well, this is a reinterpretation, this is. Re no, you can open the Rambam and you can open Avoid the The Rambam establishes this that he considered him Nachshiv Mashiach, meaning he considered him possibly or like a candidate or considered Mashiach at the time, but not Mamish Mashiach, not Ashurli Mashiach. And then you can open Avoid the Avoid the gives all the sources for the Rambam and so on and so forth, and he will, it will show you the source in the Gemara, what, what the Rambam is referencing. So the thing is that Rabbi Akiva, no, did not say that he was 100% Mamash the Mashiach, right? He's going for Galeno and so on and so forth. But he is the best candidate at the time to be held as Mashiach, and he's fulfilling the divorce of Mashiach regarding fighting the other nations and so on and so forth and fighting the disbelievers. Um, regarding, uh, regarding Paul and Jesus, yeah, Paul worshipped this guy Jesus as God. Like, he literally called a human being God in the flesh. And in before you reinterpret, like, you know, stuff from the Sefer Kabbalah about the idea of, like, the de about the deification of man and so on and so forth, he did not consider Jesus merely a deified man or, like, you know, that he had the, or that he was imbued with the R and safe and so on and so forth. But no, rather that he was literally God in the flesh, that God had a, like, a singular incarnation.
union with his body, you know, with the body of Jesus and so on and so forth, and that he was united to him in one nature, one person, and so on and so forth, one physis, uh, and that the, the literal, like, divine voice came through Jesus, and that Jesus was literally the created name of God himself. <laughs> um, and there's no evidence showing whatsoever that uh, Paul was ordained. So I'm not going to get... I'm, I'll address other things you said, by the way, but right now, I need you to get that source that says... um. That Paul was okay. ever ordained at a certain point. So, uh, so to reply back to what you said, so right. Wait, 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 no, no, no. You know, wait. I need you to get that source first. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm replying. Let me, let me reply to what you said. Okay. So I'm replying. I'm gonna get to it. Are you gonna reply so, to that? But I need you to get that yeah, source just, first before you say anything else. Yeah, I'm gonna respond to it. Let me first make my point, and I'll respond to it. Can you just be patient, please? Relax. I need you to get the source first before you make any response. Why? Well, because you keep saying that he was ordained and that therefore, like, he has some sort of... Okay, well, let, me just, let, me, let, me just, let me just finish my point, okay? Listen, there's two types of people you can debate, right? You can debate a person who has studied the works and the sources. I mean, if you're going to have a debate on Shabbatianism and Christianity, the expectation is that that person has thoroughly studied Christian works and Shabbatian works. Or you can debate somebody who has not studied those works, is not thoroughly educated on it. And All right, well, you made a claim that the source began right. that night. That's right, the other cool. person I'm debating right now, okay? Sorry, that's the other person I'm debating you haven't mm, read the sources, so you're not thoroughly educated on these matters. You're talking about Christianity. You're making all these false claims on, on, on Paul and all this stuff. How do you know? You haven't read the New Testament. You're not a Christian. Oh, no, I've, read, no, read, no, I've actually read the Church Fathers. I've read, uh, I've read Augustine. I've read Origen. I've read Dionysius, the Europa Guy, the yeah, Fufo, Dionysius, the Jerome, the Thomas You're commenting on the New Testament. You haven't read the New Testament, have you? I'm sure you haven't read the New Testament because much I mean, of what you just said right now is false. And you also you already admitted that you didn't read the works of Shabbatai and Nathan of Gaza, so you don't. Thank so God. But well, I've read oh, Jacob yeah, Frank. I have read Jacob Frank. Secondly, I need to see right now. This is what's called coping and seething and dilating and obfuscating and, and extrapolating. You're gonna have to get me a source. You don't actually well, have to be some sort of expert PhD. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have, you don't have to be some sort of expert PhD to get me a source. So please get me a source. Like I mean, literally, you claim. No, I'm not. You know, this is gonna stop right now. You claim that he was ordained and that he had smicha from Amma from Amgabaliel. You're gonna have to present an actual historical source that said this. Where, where did you even go? You are pretending as if you are on topic. How did you even get to? Well, you haven't read this. You haven't read that. You haven't read this. You haven't read that. What? That's not a source. Get me the source. You claim this. No, I'm, making, I'm, making a, I'm making a very strong point. I'm, I'm debating somebody who isn't thoroughly educated on the matters that he's willing to debate. I'm about. sorry. Like you literally told. said that that spheres, according to Orthodox Judaism, are heretical. Even though the only reason why you're saying this is that, is because that's the interpretation of Gershom Shal Moshe Adel, not the understanding of the Zayir, not the understanding of Siddhis, not the understanding of uh, not the understanding of Moshe, not the understanding of Stop! 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 Not the understanding of the Ramak, not the understanding of the Ariza, any of these people, not a single Makubo agrees with what Gershom Shalom or what uh, Moshe Dal said. All of them transmitted the idea of spheres from its original source, right, as created non-eternal or non-co-eternal emanations, okay, that of which Hashem was revealed through, and all as in reality refractions of the one divine light, and that... Hashem has no attributes, Hashem has no multiplicity, Hashem has no distinctions in himself, and he has no change. Don't call other people uneducated and then literally fail to prove anything you're saying. You've reinterpreted the Gemara and Midrashim and Sefer Kabbalah multiple times now, and then when I bring you statements not from my own opinion, not from my own, well, just my, my common sense opinion, Rather, I bring it from the Messiah, and I bring it from the different hermeneutical principles that are not laid out by people living today, but laid out by Chazal themselves, or laid out by the very sources, right, that you are citing right now, and I am, I am bringing them toward, I'm bringing them to you right now on how to understand the words, words of Chazal, as Chazal themselves had taught, not as how the Rishonim taught, not as the, how the uh, Acherinim had taught, but rather as Chazal, but from the Geonim to the Sabarim to the Amarim had taught on how to understand their words and what they mean, how they define their own statements and so on and so forth from their own mouths, not from our own presuppositions uh, over hundreds of years later or thousands of years later after them. Okay? And that's so you're saying you're just doing actual gymnastics. You just keep doing actual gymnastics. gymnastics. I am telling you what they said within the system of transmission and understanding that they had that they had made from their own mouths. Not that we have made from our, not, not not that we have in, in this time made from our own hearts, but as Chazal themselves, the same sources you're citing, had made from their own mouths. No, the only person me, doing a bunch me, of exegetical no, nonsense me, is you. What you gave me was the ignorant, blind, standard, orthodox Jewish position. Nothing Circular more, nothing more. reasoning. Can you prove that? 
Yeah, you're, you're, you said it yourself. You're, you're a Hasidic, you know... Kind so of tell me why I'm wrong. wrong. Tell me why I'm wrong. I, uh, any we, we, during this entire debate, I just showed you and demonstrated to you. You just can't see it. Just like a person can't see what you understand. Okay, you keep telling me two plus three plus five. You just can't see it, bro. So I can't help you. You can't see it. I can't help you. There's so much more I can do. I don't. What, I've done what I can. I can't do any more to help you or just. You said multiple things. You said multiple things that have no proof. You've reinterpreted all the sources that you're citing. I've shown you what they actually mean. Like I said, not from my own understanding, but like, but okay, literally from the context. Like I said, from the context of these passages and from the words of Chazal. Not like I said, not from my own words, but the words of Chazal. Okay, why, do you keep on, why do you keep on repeating yourself? We already heard you. Everyone already heard okay, you. Already no, no, I, I, I don't think you. Okay, so you've heard me. You're gonna have to respond to that point now. You're going to have I've to respond. To I'm, I'm done. Done. hiding it from Messiah. You have to stop hey, saying. I've already, it's, I've I don't already responded. Your orthodox interpretation, because you actually have to prove that it is. That is your claim. Okay, listen, I've already responded. I've already had to say what I have to say. I don't think there's any more that I, any any further. Dialogue with you at this point I would be concerned with your time. Surrender. Okay. I accept your surrender. Okay. Allah Wakbar. Uh <laughs> yeah, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> okay. Uh um, so, uh summing up the debate. Uh, if anybody wants any of the sources that I'm citing, I will be perfectly fine. Just ask me, and I will literally send them to you. Unlike um, Avi, who I Avi, I'm so sorry, but you just need to stop calling yourself that LARP name. I'm never calling you magician, Rabbi. Um, no, you're gonna have to, uh, yeah, prove anything that you said with actual sources, and you need to actually prove that your interpretation is objective. Whereas I can prove that my interpretation is objective, um, which is not my own interpretation. Like I said, it's the interpretation of Chazal. Um, and yeah, prove anything you said, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I made sure I, I gave several proofs and seals that I thought were pretty good, but you clearly didn't understand them or see them the way I did, I and mean, that's fine. You, you, you can see things the way you want to see it, and that's fine. I mean, you're, you're, I'm you're only the way I want to see them. Like, 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 for example, when you, I'm, I'm just going to bring an example, for example. So, aside from the statement about um, in the in the section of Darim, it's not even talking about one of the six hundred thirteen commandments. It's talking about rabbinic commandments. Listen, okay. we've already there's no listen, there's no there's no problem. We also we've already, have we've already the Tanya. It. Yo, stop, 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 stop. You also had the Tanya that you were citing, and you tried to allege the Tanya here is saying that the. The, not just the sages, but the Jewish people will ascend above, for example, good and evil, and that we can start like violating all the mitzvahs and, and stuff like that. But then when we read the actual context, no, you did because you said that they they ascend above no, good and evil. No, no, never, never, never this like, new that. Torah. Never, you said that this new Torah would come down or whatever it is that would replace the old one. But the Tanya, yeah, actually, with the Mashiach, because the, because the Tanya because never what, said anything. Stops this up. The Tanya never said anything right about the about this about the, the tree of life being a new Torah which replaces this old one, which is from the you know it's. It from the Itzadas and so on and so forth it doesn't say that at all. Rather, what it was talking about is the idea that in Yemei Mashiach, when we transcend, that the Tamid Chachomim will no longer rely upon those who sin or will no longer have to receive anything from those who sin in any sort of metaphysical sense. Rather, for and they will no longer keep the Torah as a way to prevent themselves from sinning. Rather, they will keep the, Rather, they will no. They will no longer have that need, and they will merely keep the Torah for the sole fact. Uh, as, a, as a practice of unification and imitating God and so on and so forth uh, in reality. Rather, the people who did not, right, they're the people who are now, who did not become Tamadich HaChom, who did not become Tzadikim in this life before the coming of Mashiach, they will require to keep tired to prevent themselves from sinning in Yimei Mashiach, whereas the Tzadikim, will, they will have their Yitzhahara absolutely annulled, annulled, and they will transcend beyond the tree, of, the tree of life and the tree of good and evil, and they will see things above this, whereas the the lower people will not see things about this while they will still transcend, etc., etc., etc. It's not talking about some sort of new tire coming and superseding them. In fact, okay. the same place in the time, like I said, literally shows that they would actually be continuously keeping and learning tire and so on and so forth, just simply as a means not to prevent themselves from sinning anymore. Do you okay. reinterpret so, what's just happening? Okay, right. So I guess I'll just make the final point. So I, clear to me, you don't understand Remez or Sod. And maybe just learn to make no, no, no. This this shot Remez and Sod. It's that you keep reinterpreting things, and you keep thinking that no, you are interpreting them. You keep on saying that. that these are you keep your on saying own that. understandings. These are not the Remez and Sod. Like for example, okay. the uh, this, oh, the Eden, Eden, you know what, Eden? I, I gotta go. I gotta go, Eden. This is this guy just 
just keeps on interrupting and just keeps on. Yeah, you know, because what you keep saying is like absurd. I'm sorry. I just like uh, well, uh, the difference is I'm not. I'm not like a debate person. I'm not like a, you know. I don't. I don't debate for the sake of debating. I debate for the sake of disproving absolute falsehood. Like for example, the statuses used to bring. I, I you know when it comes to levels of interpretation or different methods of interpretation, right? You're arguing. Oh, I'm I'm arguing from the remes and the sod and so on and so forth. Well, the thing is that the Sadducees, when they came to the Parashim, I'm I don't know if you're aware of the thirteen different the the, the thirteen different principles of interpretation, the thirteen uh, different principles of hermeneutics that were laid out by Chazal, right? The Sadducees actually used to use Kalbachomer arguments. They actually used to use arguments from uh, from the stronger and so on and so forth. They used to abide, you know use that principle to try and work. Uh, Sadasi, you know, their Sadasian ideology into the written text of the Torah. But what Chazal would do is that they would come and prove that their usage of Kalva Homer is sufficient. So, sorry, sorry, is deficient. It is not sufficient at all. So the thing is that you can have sufficient, uh, you can have, you know, you can have sufficient interpretations within the principles, and you can have deficient interpretations within the principles. And we can see, and we can see what is efficient and deficient. Okay. Your right. so-called usage of Remes and Saud is deficient. Okay, is not, that's fine. Not okay, and, you're, and that's fine. You, you can believe that. Anyway, Sharbin, I'm, I'm kind of done here. You know, um, I, I did what I could, and uh, it is what it is. So, um, yeah, it's pretty much uh, over for me now, Ian. So I think I'm gonna head out now. Okay. okay. Bye. Um, okay. Bye. Okay. So uh, let's sum up the debate. Um, I win there. I I claim victory. This is one of the. I I will claim the victory victory over this one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this was a debate between an approach that sees Judaism as a perennial, um, a, a perennial wisdom that is consistent throughout all the ages. To an approach that is more in line with secular academics, to see Kabbalah as something that is linear and develops through history. Um, so it's basically between those who believe in the, the Sinaitic revelation and everything was given there, to those who um, see things in a more visionistic way. Um, so we've seen that the source, the sources of the perennial wisdom of Judaism are consistent with each other. Um, there has been disagreement, um, but fundamentally, uh, we've seen that Judaism is ultimately consistent with itself. That's what I can say from this debate. Um, so also, there's no such thing as Machlekes on whether or not the Torah is eternal, as I've already established, and his only response was reinterpretation, even though I was literally just citing the text itself and its context and what the sages and the students of the sages said about those exact statements and how they defined them. So, like I said, I'm not reinterpreting them according to my own word, but rather according to the words of the people who literally said those very statements. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's basically... Yeah, so uh, it's uh, on the question of misinterpretation, whether if you can misinterpret something and produce something novel that is consistent with itself or you can't misinterpret anything. Because, you know, uh, the question is whether you, can, you have the right to misinterpret perennial sources. Um, you don't. As Chazal themselves don't. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's Chazal themselves that you don't. Yeah. So, uh, okay. This was a ride. Um, if anyone wants to step up and uh, debate anyone, like debate Chief, Chief, uh, debate um, Yosef, then you just tell me on DMs or something. You know, you said you had to head out, but you're still here, by the way. I'm just, just weird. <laughs> Abby. Well, I, just, I, just want, I decided to stay and just listen to see how it ends. That's all. Yeah, I think I summed it up in a more um, neutral way, I guess. Try to. But, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, have fun. Um, if you wanted a rap bottle... <laughs> People here wanted a rap battle, but I don't know if that's possible. But okay. Well, I have a I have a question for you, Rap Eden. Right? You claim that this is your friend, and I know that you're a Neo Sabbatean. I mean, have you tried to debate your friend? I mean, or I mean, or talk to him about your beliefs, or no? I mean, not, you call yourself sure. a Sabbatean? Uh, 
It's complicated. No, yes or no, like you uh, what? <laughs> I've told the LARP, you that... I just the LARP needs to stop. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I've seen like the stuff you post on Twitter. You need to like people who read secular academics, okay? Or like modern like whatever Renaissance philosophy, this is all LARPing. This is all live action role playing that you are doing. Nobody cares. Uh, I mean literally it is no significance to the truth whatsoever. You can find all of the truth within the words of Chazal, within the words of the Chachomim and so on and so forth. There's no need to study this like, you know, whatever Renaissance like analytical philosophy garbage. It's all nonsense. Kind of lazy and you need to stop reinterpreting things according to your own opinions. You need to understand the objective system which things are brought down. I'm not saying you should believe blindly. God forbid that you believe blindly. After all, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi says that, you know, we go with him who has the, you know, the better evidence, right? But... You need to understand that the system of truth in the words of Chazal, in the words of the Tyre, and so on and so forth, you need to understand that that system exists, and you need to understand the objectivity of that system, and you should not just keep reinterpreting things according to your own opinions and keep changing your ideology, and keep changing your belief system, keep changing your ashkaf, your outlook of the world, every five minutes. Yeah, I don't like analytical philosophers. I just, I, I just particularly like... Elliot Wolfson, because he finds very novel ideas in Kabbalah that, for instance, other scholars didn't find, because, for instance, Sholem is very much that Kabbalah is consistent. He was in hell. Like, Sholem, Sholem saw Kabbalah is consistent with Neoplatonism, for instance. That's I mean, because he reinterpreted Kabbalah according to, like, his own standard, or whatever it is, and literally, just, I mean, literally, he refused. Like, I, how many times... Was he corrected by Rav Reuven Margolis? Like, how many times was he, corre well, how many times was he corrected think, by I him? I think he had a lot of misconceptions. I know some Hasidic they were people all perfect. That. And the reason why he was so evil is because he knew they were wrong. Like, the secular academics of today, like what, like what this... Uh, he was wrong Adam about Hasidut. He was wrong he about Hasidut. He was wrong, he was wrong about everything. He was wrong about like, the con consistency of Neoplatonism and he, Kabbalah. He was wrong, but just listen. He was wrong about everything. He, he, he did the exact thing that all secular PhDs, all secular academics who study in these modern universities and stuff like that, um, like the Tubingen school, whatever it is that existed back then, he was wrong like how all of them are wrong. They apply their modern hermeneutic, their modern presuppositions to the Torah, and instead of understanding it with the hermeneutic that was passed down alongside the Torah, alongside these different ancient works, and not just of Judaism, but of any religion, and they literally interpret them to their own subject objective personal presuppositions not to the understanding that was given alongside the terror itself okay and not even under not, i mean i mean really like in the, in the systematic transmission of terror they just cherry pick and pick apart things rip them out of context redefine them in a modern way and so on and so forth that's what gershom shalom did and it, yeah, I mean, he's just the garbage is unbelievable. And the, the issue is that he and the secular academics of today know that these systems exist. They know that these systems have always existed alongside the Torah. And they know that they can't disprove that. They know that this thing can only be proven and so on and so forth. Um, and they were, know that they're wrong. And they regardless still do it. Like, like you know, Gershom Sholem, he acknowledged all the corrections that Rav Ruben Margolis made against him regarding the Zayr, regarding the Kabbalah, regarding the idea of emanations and so on and so forth. And he just continued, like, putting out these ideas anyway, even though he admitted that he had no response to these corrections. Now, Gershom Shalom, at least he had some Yerashimayim. He had some Yerashimayim. Why? Because when he would do Havdalah, right, he would bring up, he would, do, like, he would, uh, he would actually do Havdalah and so on and so forth. And he would shake and tremble when he was doing Havdalah uh, and he would do it in line with how the Zaria called instructions. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Still I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I think, I think, yeah, I, I agree that Shalom had a lot of misconceptions. I think that Kabbalah scholarship is varied because there are Kabbalah scholars who do try to be consistent with the perennial aspect. There's of no, I just, I just, I'm sorry, but I, I forgot, I'm sorry, Abu, Abu Limbo, there's no reason to read them. You should read the Ramak, the Ramchal, the people. Yeah, I do, I do, I do, but, you know, there, there are aspects that Kabbalah is vague about them, you know. The, for instance, uh, whether if, if, if darkness is a negative or affirmative concept, whether if dof, darkness is merely absence of light, or whether if it has a... a, a this is a machlokes. It is a machlokes. It is yeah, something that is Yeah, but we don't need secular fact. academics to interpret... We don't need secular academics to interpret that for us. We already have that laid out in the Messiah. Yeah, but I th I, what I'm saying is that there is vagueness. There is, you know, 
there is there is disagreement and there's it's not vagueness, place for interpretation. It's, it's it, okay, but the thing is, you already have different farm talking about this, and these farm aren't written by people who like you know come from secular PhDs. These are, these are written by people who have learned student you know teacher to student teacher to student back to all these different authors in Kabbalah. So like like I said, they're all written in Hebrew. You know, okay, you know this is this is your this is your language that you learned since you were a child. Okay, you can. Uh, pick up any safer, okay, that which is written about, and you can learn from that within the context of the Messiah, within the same definitions that were used by the Mokobalim, not within the position, not within the presuppositions of secular academics. It's a waste of time. It's pseudo intellectual garbage. They have no knowledge of the world, and they and they reinterpret everything. So yeah, you don't need secular academics to understand the machlekes. The machlekes is already laid out. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, but you, you know. Um... Um, you know, I, th I think that philosophy can provide you with a, with a perspective on these machlokes. Because Kabbalah can just, just read, I mean, literally just read the text itself and then read the commentary on the text, not provided by technically, but provided by the students of these people. So, this is it. Simple. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we, when talking about Luriani Kabbalah, I see a lot of stretches. There are a lot of stretches. What do you mean by um, stretches? Like what? People try to extract from their um, things that don't exist there. Like what? Well, I'm sorry, I'm just confused. Like, tell me a specific thing that you're calling a stretch. Y you know, for instance, I, I, read, I read a lot of Wolfson. And he, for instance, uh, is who? in a Wolfson. El Elliot Wolfson. I have no idea who that person is. Just I, Can you just cite something from the Ari, the, the Ari himself or like from Afghan Vital or from anybody like, and then tell me what it is and then I can clarify it for you like whatever it is, man. I can from Sarug, for instance, that Sarug talks about uh, Shashua and stuff like that. I don't think he means it in the, in the same way when Wolfson interprets it as the Jewish sons, which is a concept from Lacanian psychoanalysis. I'm sorry, wait, 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 just wait, wait. What is, um, just, just tell me what the stretch is in the, the Kabbalah of the Arizal. Like, what, 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 what you, you referenced the concept that didn't hear, what was it? Sarug. Huh? Sarug. Sarug, yeah. Oh, Sarug. Okay, what's wrong with it? Because, you know, when, it, when Sarug says Shashua, it means something that, you know, uh, is uh, more like, um... Um, you know, just kind of, uh, uh, some kind of desire, but something that is a desire for, um, um, it, it's complicated, but, you know, it's, it's not desire in the same sense that Wolfson finds in it when he reads this as Jewish sons, that's like I, something. I can't, so I just, I can't tell exactly like what you're, I'm just, I just can't tell what you're talking about exactly what. Uh, just, continue, just continue. Well, I just, I just mean that you know, Shashua in Sog is not that overcomplicated thing. It's just, um, it's a sort, some sort of play, playfulness uh, of God that he's he's a little bit playful in the sense that this infinity is vibrant. No, I'll, I'll, wait, wait, wait. Here, I'll, tell, I'll tell you this. Are, are you saying, what do you mean by, okay, so what do you mean by playfulness? What do you mean? Like, you said in the sense of it was infinity being vibrant. What do, what do you mean by vibrance? That, that's the thing. I think that, I, I think that Wolfson says in it something vibrant, that means temporal, you know. No, 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 hold on, hold on. And this is the problem. I, I, I think that, you know, so wait, doesn't wait. talk about something temporal. It, it speaks wait, wait. of something eternal. And that's wait, where wait. the problem comes in. I'll tell you this. When you learn the Mkubalim, you're not going to find anything. You're not going to find anything which says that God is somehow in time. That he that's has any what time. I said. That's what I said. I found it because of okay. a stretch. When Wolf well, that's said, not a it's that's not a stretch. That just you mean a stretch in like the interpretation of like secular academics? Yeah. Okay, I thought you meant like a stretch in like the actual like Indian itself. Okay. No. So you go like I said, go into any safer Kabbalah. Go to actually any safer. I mean, once again, like even even on Kaifum, you're not going to find that there is any rejection of Hashem being outside space and time. Him being pure act. Him being yeah, unchanging. That's what I'm saying. Being, 
That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that people today try to extract from Kabbalah something much different than what is implied in Kabbalah because okay, we in Kabbalah, God is eternal, it's out of time, it's out of space, it's out of uh, all kind of apprehension, comprehension, and whatever. It's mm -hmm. something infinite, absolute, one, all, all of these sort of I, stuff. Mm -hmm. You're going to find two statements, or four, okay? Well, you know, these are the four statements you're going to find. One, you're going to find the Shemin's Ein Seif, that he is the Ein Seif, that he's infinite, and you're going to find that he is above Ein Seif. Now, these two things, they may seem different, but they actually mean the same thing. This means that Hashem is boundless, but on account of his boundlessness, he is unknowable. Meaning, boundless is a word, it is a term, it is a category. So the thing is, because of the fact that Hashem is infinite and we cannot know him, okay, he is even above the category of boundlessness because it is a, it is a category which is known in creation and is created. Yeah, uh, it, is about, it is above the division between eternity and temporality. Yes, so those are the, because he created eternity, he created, he created temporality and so on and so forth. Those are the two, two. Those are the two words that may seem opposite at first, but actually mean the same thing. Then you're going to find another statement: Hashem is His attributes, or Hashem has no attributes. Okay, what does this mean? This means two things, or sometimes you mean three things. But we'll talk about the from the perspective of the uncreated. When it says that Hashem is His attributes, it means that everything in attribute, for example, is something which is inherent within an essence. Okay, it is something which is inherent within something, and so on and so forth. My my skin tone my speech, my action, like my state of being, and so on and so forth, right? These are all distinct attributes within myself, right? Whereas within Hashem, all the attributes are one and the same, okay? Meaning that his, and meaning that there's no distinction between essence and attribute in Hashem. Rather, everything in Hashem is one and the same. It is all equal to one another. It is all identified as the same, etc. And therefore, Hashem is entirely one with no distinction and no multiplicity and no change. And then the other statement, he has no attributes, means the same thing as an attribute is something which is inherently distinct from another thing. It is an aspect and so on and so forth, an identifiable thing, a distinct thing, something which changes, something which is mutable, whereas, whereas there are no aspects, there are no identifiable things within Hashem, and there is no mutability, there is no change, there is no distinction, there is no difference or variation or multiplicity within Hashem, whereas an attribute is an inherent, is a, is an inherent variance or difference within something. Hence, Hashem has no attributes, and he's above that category, infinitely transcends it, with no distinction or difference between him. Then you will also find well, the statement, uh, this is one more, oh, yeah. then you'll find regarding saying that Hashem is his attributes, uh, the other statement is that the only thing that we identify Hashem by is his attributes. But these attributes of which we identify Hashem by are not in his essence. They are created emanations. They, he infinitely transcends them. They're not eternal, right? They're not co-eternal with many sins. They're not co-existent. They were created, period. And they are, they are we, they, we, we perceive them in this world as infinite, but in reality, again, relative to Hashem, they're not infinite. Relative to us, they appear as infinite, right? So the thing is, is that, um, yeah, we only know Hashem by his created attributes, um, and yeah, those are all the statements, and therefore we say that, for example, Hashem is his attributes. Those, those are the different meanings of the statements, and so on and so forth. Uh, the statement that he's his attributes is, is, has two meanings. One, that everything in him is one and the same, and he, and he has no attributes, and is infinitely transcendent. And two, that we identify Hashem by creation, i.e. by his created attributes, which are not connected to him, they're not inherent to him, and so on and so forth. And yeah, then there's also, um, one more thing I'm forgetting. You can also find the statement that, you know, he is one, and you'll find the statement he is not one. But, you know, you'll never find the statement that it says that Hashem is many. You'll never find the statement that Hashem is many. You'll find that he is not one. What does it mean? Uh, it means the same thing as he is one. It means that one is a number, whereas when numbers are created, they're they're a perceivable object within creation. So hence Hashem transcends all things which are knowable within creation or, and all things which are created. And he transcends every number due to his infiniteness and due to his infinite transcendence and so on and so forth. Hence, when we say that he is one, we only mean that he is not many. Yeah, those are all the um, different kinds. Or, or it can be paradoxically both one and many, and this is where there is that. No, the many, but but the the, the the him being many is only in a created sense. Is only in a sense of emanation, not in a sense of his essence or any sort of uncreated thing. Oh, okay. So, uh, so the exteriority within God itself, within the Godhead, for instance, it doesn't. Within a Shem's it. essence, you should just say within a Shem's essence, within his very being. Right? Uh, there is no multiplicity change. Yeah, I know. I know that. You know, but within the creation, position. and within that which is identified as Hashem, not within himself, not within himself, but within creation, right? There is what appears to be variance, and this variance is merely the reflection of the created light, the Aryan safe, and so on and so forth. But that is only within creation, that is only within that which is identified of created things, not of, not, not of that which is inherent or identified to Hashem. 
Hence, the manyness is only in the created sense, not in the sense of Hashem himself, not in the sense of any uncreate uh, any uncreatedness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this very much a response to what I was what I was saying that people try to find in Kabbalah something much more, say, uh, radical than what is actually in the Kabbalah because. I, for instance, read Derrida, and Derrida, he does mention Kabbalah very few times. He, about two pages from his entire corpus is dedicated to, to Kabbalah, so he didn't really invest too much of himself into it, but he was very much influenced by the Shalemian misinterpretation of Kabbalah when he was speaking of a God who is fundamentally a living dead, who contains within itself and just states it just states with itself with its own mortality. And this idea is very foreign to Kabbalah, mm-hmm. to, the, to the perennial wisdom of Judaism. Uh, but it's, it's a, a more poetic misinterpretation of it that was also informed by Jabez, who was a poet who also immersed himself in Kabbalistic scriptures, but he also seemed to make the make the assumption make the conclusion from them that God is in some sense self exteriorized and temporal and all these things. But you know this there's the position that God is both temporal and atemporal or supratemporal. That's not in Kabbalah. The things resolve themselves in a paradoxical unity. Um, well no here, here. not in, in, in like in Kabbalah the only thing you're going to find in relation about Hashem and time the only thing that you're going to find about saying that Hashem is within time is, in, like I said, in the sense of created expression or emanation, not in the sense of himself, not in the yeah, sense but, of... Yeah, but, you know, for yeah. instance, uh, i just give you one anecdote. It's not really f- fundamentally important, but, for instance, when uh, there is... I, I guess that the issue of the Godhead is uh, a, bit, a bit different, but... Um, you know, um, there is there is a different uh, there there are different approaches to temporality. Uh, you know, there's, there there are approaches to temporality that talk about unity and temporality. There's there's different idea there's different ideas of time, but when it comes to the actual unity of Hashem, there's not even a, there's there's a complete consensus in every sefer Kabbalah that Hashem is entirely outside space and time. And the only sense in which you can say that he's truly within time or truly within change is, like I said, through the oyer, and the oyer is created. So, yeah, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I guess um, I, I, I bring up that um, when the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe speaks of temporality in uh, Torah Menachem. He does. He does speak of the, you know, the, the lack of distinction between eternity and temporality, and he says that temporality is eternal, eternity is temporal. That there is. Yes, but then eternal. he says, in relation to Hashem, that's why he says that eternity is created. The idea of being ad oilam is merely created. Yeah, not and not something within Hashem himself, which we can agree with because the idea of something being forever or existing from eternity past is an identifiable thing within creation. So the idea of eternity is created because of the fact that it's something which is, like I said, uh, knowable within time. Whereas Hashem, like we said, is beyond the idea of eternity and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah it's like it's like he's beyond eternity. So, so, we, so this beyondness, there should be explication what it is to some extent. I think that people in the world of Kabbalah don't try to ask what is the end of? You mean don't... sex of academics or actual Mekubalim? Mekubalim, no always. Mekubalim, like, <laughs> the Luria, he doesn't speak a lot about what was before. He speaks what the was Ariza... within the Tzimtzum. What was the Ari... No, the Arizal says that you can't know what was prior to all of creation yeah. because that's the one infinite essence of Hashem. Yeah, exactly. And, so, you know, philosophers, you can't philosophers, yeah, and philosophers and academics do try to account what is that infinity when we when we say in so what do we what do we mean? The, Ari- the, Ari- the, Ari- the Arizal says, like I said, that Hashem's essence is infinitely transcendent and that he's even beyond the idea of essence, he's beyond the idea of existence, anything identifiable, and that's what all the Mikobalim agree with. In reality, you can't encapsulate the essence or the self of Hashem, so 
Yeah, so so this this is this is also a point of machlokis because you know. It's not a machlokis in Kabbalah. Not not in Kabbalah, but generally, uh, like whether if you can think the unthinkable. Uh, if you can, then Hashem's, then Hashem's made of parts, like literally, like uh, so. Um, yeah, I think that I think that you can come to a point where you you don't need where where, where you think. The unthinkable, not in a way that you make it thinkable. It remains unthinkable, but you try to think the unthinkable, and this is paradoxical, but things sometimes resolve themselves in paradox. I think that this is the conclusion of contemporary trends in philosophy that come and say, well, let's pick the unspeakable, let's name the nameless, let's think the the unthinkable, and try to to um, to 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 bypass uh, some sort of thought um, thought barrier. That I think you're just talking about transcendent knowledge of the air. Maybe is that what I, you mean? I don't know. Uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't hear what you said. Transcendent what? The transcendent knowledge of the other Einstein, but not the Einstein. Is the Einstein, is Einstein, is Einstein and above Einstein? I don't know, um, but if that's a concept, um, then, then you know, uh, Wolfson, for instance, he sees a lot of paradoxical resolutions in Kabbalah. He, he, sees, he sees this vagueness about the Einstein as something that's like, you know, that you, the, 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 these aspects, they remain in a question whether if they're paradoxical or whether we just leave them alone. Whether no, but like nobody, but nobody, nobody says, nobody says that the, the essence of Hashem is knowable. They say that everybody says the opposite in Kabbalah, in, in, in Sefer Kabbalah. Yeah, and yeah, in I'm, I'm saying that it remains unknowable. It remains unknowable. But, yeah, but, still, uh, they, we, but they don't say that you can even in any sense encapsulate the essence of Hashem. Just in no yeah. sense you can encapsulate it. So Yeah, and I'm saying that's correct. I'm saying that... I'm saying that this is the thing that that we we are not trying to make the unthinkable thinkable, or to, but yeah, yeah but I just I think you're talking lovely. about like I think you're just talking about knowing Hashem through the air, in which you're only knowing the air and so if you're not knowing the essence of Hashem. Well, um, because that that that's the resolution that all the Mukabalim come to. Because the air is not a physical light. The air is beyond any even spiritual light. The oh, yeah, beyond... the or. The or. Yeah. Oyer or or? I say oyer because Ashkenazi. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah, I, I get what you, I get but what you, what you mean. Itself, but, you know, the I, I, or, yeah, the or is something that, that, that we don't really know why, but it describes that. בחי <laughs> בהר סיני, אנחנו, מה קרה בהר סיני? אני אגיד את זה באנגלית, אוקיי? אני אעשה את זה באנגלית. על הר סיני, על סיני, אוקיי? What they saw, like for example, what is the proof that Moshe Rabbani is a true, a true Navi? How do we know that Navi is like a Navi Shekhar? Because even the Sefer, the Sefer and the Sefer ask this question, they say, okay, well we have the fire coming down. Okay, uh, a Navi Shekhar can do that. We say, even the Navi Shekhar, this is Sefer, the volume 841, can do this. Okay, Sefer, the volume 841, a Navi Shekhar can bring down the fire from the sky. Okay, what else? Um, she could uh, the makos. Okay, Navi Shekhar can do makos. What else? The makos are um, you know, makot. You know, I'm a kot bin be'el some slime. But um, the so what is what is the answer? It's that at Har Sinai, the fabric of reality, the literal gashmias, meaning the physical world, the veil on the physical world was pulled back, and the fabric of reality was broken, and they saw. Everything which transcended all things, even that of the spiritual world, even that which is above the spiritual world, going all the way, all the way, all the way up until the Ur Ein Sof, which they were united with, and they didn't do it after they died. They did it in their bodies, their very bodies, all at one time, multiple times, and so on and so forth. And they saw not just the spiritual, but that which is in, that which is uh, in from our perspective, not in reality. It's not really infinite. Um, that which appears as endlessly beyond. The uh, the spiritual world and physical world and so on and so forth, which is the Orion Seif. 
So, you know, oh, and so forth. So that, that, that is the knowing that you're talking about. Yeah, but, you know, when you try to just to think why, why would you use the analogy to or, specifically? Because, because or Before, is something that no. is event-sent. It's, it's not really, it's indefinite, it's opened. It's a realm no. of openness. No. What do you mean? Then, then why would you people use the analogy to or? Or, the, when we say or and save, or and save is not like a physical leg. I said it's beyond all any physical, it's beyond the physical world entirely. Uh, that transcends it. When I'm, the or and safe is like the word or is just an analogy for whatever the or and safe is, but it's not something like a, you can't define it necessarily as like anything like an essence or something like that. But yeah. But rather, well, but my point is that they had transcendent divine knowledge at Har Sinai, but they never beheld the divine essence of Hashem. Well, okay. Um, I, I, I still, I still wonder why would you, um, why, why would you use the word "all" specifically? Because that, that that's what the Orient Safe is. Orient Safe, like everything is merely the this is the understanding of Kabbalah. Everything and the Torah. Everything is merely the aura and soif, or, or just an emanation of the aura and soif. That's it. Everything, just the aura and soif, just being di refracted in different ways. Um. Yeah. So. So. But, but I think that the analogy to aura is specifically because. Uh, but what do you? I just. You need to. I. I don't know well, why you're asking the question. Like, what do you mean analogy to aura? I don't know why. Because, because you use the word all specifically, and not, for instance, the unknowable God. You don't say the unknowable God. I'm saying they knew God. the or because that's what you're actually knowing. When you know something, that's what you're you know. It's not the atzmut, it's the or. It's not the atmos, yes, you're not knowing atmos, you're knowing or. Yeah. Okay, so I'm getting what you're saying. But, but what, I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm saying to think the unthinkable is not, is not speaking of knowing through the or. I'm speaking of... Trying to trying to think the unthinkable, literally. Nobody, but no Mikubal says that you can know the Atma. I'm, I'm just saying this is something which is not. Yeah, existing. I'm saying it's not compatible with 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 okay. Orthodox Kabbalah. Um, Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like uh, it's basically uh, it's a misinterpretation that that is because of uh, some sort of vagueness about what is beyond there because people don't talk about what's beyond there because it's unthinkable but because it's it remained in the realm of unthinkableness it's something that's considered vague because because there are as i said contemporary trends in philosophy that say that you 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 can try to think the unthinkable if you even if you don't you even if you arrive it's nowhere and you don't manage to think anything you're still in the attempt of thinking a questioning in a, in a pro, in a not process, but you're in the act of questioning something, and and this act of questioning, it's a realm of openness of it, any definiteness that 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 is something that is rather um, a, a new realm that is opened because of this question raised by Kabbalah: What is there out there? And we can't say what's there out there. But but yet this the answer what might have not been given, but the question has been raised, and I think this is the revolution of Kabbalah that the question has been raised. Um, but that's just my interpretation. I, I don't. Okay, I don't, there's no there's no way you can know the the, the, the so there's no there's no way you can know the Atma science. Yeah, okay. I, I'm I'm not saying anything else. No, I'm I know, saying I just, it's no. unthinkable. I'm saying it's unthinkable, it's inconceivable, it's infinite, but, but, but yet you can, you, 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 you can re reach this realm of indefiniteness. I, uh, I, mm, I don't know. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say so. It's an I don't know, it's a question. Uh, this is... I, I, I mean, like, you're just going to have to show me what you're talking about within, like, Seafrey Kabbalah itself, yeah. Because uh, I'm not really getting what you're saying. But yeah, at least right now. Okay, so uh, yeah. Um, if anyone else wants to debate him, just send me a DM or something. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, Shavrishtus. Uh, Shavrishtus. Uh, you missed. You missed the chief magician. He was here before, and he debated him. That guy was not guy, in yeshiva. That yeah, guy was lying. That guy yeah. is definitely <laughs> never in yeshiva. The guy who's called the chief magician of Babylon is not the actual chief magician of Babylon. It's it's the Hasidic guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, changed I'm not, his I'm not, name. I'm not, I'm not the, I, I did not uh, change my name to this. Somebody else did. But yeah, um, it, um, that guy it's literally. Like, it's like changed. Guy, this guy has never been in yeshiva in his life. Um, there's no way because anybody who's been in yeshiva and like opened like the tour, opened the shulchan aruch, like will know like things that he's just like will know that he's just literally lying about like what he said about Zion, about what he said about spheres and so on and so forth. But yeah. Like he's literally just like a secular academic larper. That's what it is. He wants to like he reads he like he sits on his he sits on his computer reading JSTOR articles all day and stuff like that. And he says, "Well, Jews just reinterpret everything. How? Oh, you just do because it's good. It <laughs> like no, we contextualize it and we show what the context is. Like I said, not from our own personal hermeneutic, but from one the actual words of Chazal expounding upon what they said, and two from the hermeneutic of Chazal, not from what we think or personally say." Or what he likes to call common sense interpretations. Like he literally interpret. He literally said that when something is called new, it's common sense that there's like a modification or something. So like, or, or like to the law. And I established well, what it, when it says new, what it means specifically is not that there's going to be new laws, but rather the newness is that it is better practiced, better remembered by the people that it is given to than the old law. Hence, it is not like the covenant given to our fathers, where there were many uh, failures and attempts to in keep in keeping it and so on and so forth. And like I said, this is not my own opinion. This is what it says in the text. As the text itself, the same place that he's citing, literally says, if these laws are ever abolished before me right then the then, then the people of israel will cease to be a nation before me and he literally says that the torah god himself says that the torah this covenant that he has already given is eternal just as the sun and moon are eternal so literally says in jeremiah 31 you can literally read it for yourself and, and he says that the newness of the covenant as well is that it will be remembered onto the fathers and sons under the hearts of the fathers and sons and on, on their mouths and so on and so forth so you know, it's implied. It's implied at how? No, it's just implied. This is a common sense interpretation. And the Leviathan too. Well, no, the Leviathan is the, the Leviathan has literally what are called great fins, meaning it is not. It does not have the trefa. It does not have the trefa of a snake or a crocodile. Whereas crocodiles, for example, have the crocodiles and snakes due to the fact that they are land serpents. They are their own species. They are a. They have a specific aspect in them that causes them to be tra- you know, that, has, that causes them to be trait. Whereas Leviosin does not have that aspect. Leviosin, as a result of lacking that aspect, is as a result kosher. That's not a reinterpretation. That's literally just a part of the nature of the Leviosin. And we can also go into the thing where he said about commandments being abolished in the future, or or not, or being nullified in the future. That was about rabbinic commandments, as he's talking about the mitzvah of embalming somebody, which is not a mitzvah in the Torah. That that is a that is not a rabbinic command. That is not a halacha l'moshe masinai. So I'm sorry. That is sorry. That is not a. Um, did I say that is not? Uh, I'm sorry. I said that is not a commandment. That's right. That's not a commandment which was given to Moshe Messina. I, I, I might have said it's not a rabbinic commandment. It is a rabbinic commandment. But you get my point. Rabbinic commandments yeah. are not ad oilam, so they're not additions to the Torah or anything like that. They are not Torah of Moshe Messina. That which is not Torah of Moshe Messina is only temporal, whereas the Torah of itself is not temporal, hence it is eternal. But if you try to add something to that eternity and say that this thing that I had added or removed from is an eternal addition or an eternal removal, then that would be adding and removing to as defined by the Torah itself, as defined by the Rambam, as defined by the Rabban, as defined by everybody, Rabbeinu Gershom and so on and so forth. So... And he says, oh, you're just, you know, doing this and this and this and this and this. It's just the exegetical mental gymnastics. It's like, that's your only response. Can you prove? Can you, can you, like, actually, like, like lay it out in premises? Like, how am I actually doing so-called exegetical mental gymnastics? It's like, it's just like, it's like an emotional argument. But like I said, you haven't, I, I, I cited a bunch of psukim in the Tanakh that established the Torah is eternal. I cited two different statements from two different Nevi'im saying that the Torah cannot be added to, it cannot be removed from by anybody, by any prophet, and so on and so forth, right? Hence is the statement, it is not in heaven. Hence is the statement uh, that a Novi Rasha, the Chadish Davar Me'ata, a Novi cannot add something, uh, or cannot innovate something from this point onward, from the point of the revelation of that one Pasuk in Vayikra that says Eileha Mitzvah, and that's in, in Tamora 16a, and various other places in the, in the Mikra, and so on and so forth. Uh, and yeah, even in the sugya between Ben Zayma on uh, Yitzhak Mitzrayim, where he establishes that, where Chazal establishes, Rabban and literally established that the Torah 
is eternal and its mitzvah is eternal and that there will be no new Torah in Yisrael. You can also read Sefer Yikarim, Sefer Yikarim by Rav Yosef Albo. Rav Yosef Albo even disputes with the Rambam on certain premises, but he specifically says that the Torah is eternal. The Torah given to Moshe Rabbi Yaharsin as eternal. Mashiach will not come and add in the Torah. And no source says that Mashiach will come and give us a new Torah. No source says that Mashiach will come and bring us new laws, new commandments, new statutes and judgments and so on and so forth. Rather, the only newness that Mashiach is going to bring is the underst- is is a new understanding of the Torah itself and of reality. While we will have the same understanding as we do now, uh, the different understanding, the new understanding that we are going to have is how the Torah is the essence of the world. Not that we will change our, not that we will change our understanding now, or that, the, uh, but rather that our understanding now will be the same and will have more revealed about it and so on and so forth. But no new laws, no new commandments, no new practices, no new statutes, no new judgments, and so on and so forth. And no letter added to or removed from. Okay. Yeah, that is my point. Uh, what he said about Spheris is a lie. I can quote. I, I can quote every Mukubal who's ever lived. I checked the, um, I checked Shah Akadama, by the way, by... Uh, I, I searched Shashar Dhamma, which, which he was citing. He said the first 15 pages. I searched the first 20. Nothing is said about the Torah from, from Harsinai being given by, uh, by Samael. Nothing is said about the Talmud. Nothing is said about um, how, you, how, how you shouldn't say Talmud or whatever. You should only say Kabbalah and be wasting much time studying Talmud or whatever it is. Or like some sort of Marcionite ideal. Nothing even similar to what he said. Uh, I couldn't find it anywhere. And he said that he gave me it, but he hasn't, so... Also, I've yet to see a source that says that Paul was a rabbi. Oh, I'm sorry, a a rab, a rab, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Viper. I also heard this story. I don't know where, but I, it's not affirmed. Um. Yeah, I mean the old Christianity thing is not really my the my uh, delicate I don't really like Christianity to be honest uh, mm. what's up Yitzchak mm. so okay I'm uh, removing the mutes from the people okay finally Okay. Um good good debate. Good debate. <laughs>